the biggest problem with the study of human population genomics these days is the lack of diversity in the representations. Most of the databases out there contain genomes from either the Western or the East Asian populations. The Malays, which are colored in dark red colors here, and there are many other sub ethnic groups, are the largest Australasian groups in Southeast Asia. But unfortunately, their genomes are very much underrepresented. Brunei, which is a country located on the northern Borneo with a population of about 400,000, and of this, two thirds of them are the Malays. In Brunei, the Malays are made up of seven sub ethnic groups. And to date, we actually know very, very little about the genomes of the Malay in this part of Southeast Asia. So what we did was to take 41 individuals, uh, Malays from, from Brunei, uh, and look into the genome. Our approach consisted of two steps. First, we did a mapping against the human reference genomes, and then we took uh, the AMEP reads and did a de novo assemblies. So for the mapping exercise, we took the two local Malays, the two Dusuns, and used BWA to map it against the broad uh, HG38 reference genomes. And then uh, we called the variants using three different tools, namely GATK, VCF2s, and free Bayes. And we also look into the CMVs in these two genomes, and then we annotate all the variants and CMVs that we found in the uh, two individuals. And then later on, so what we found is that our mapping exercises managed to cover approximately 94 to 95% of the human reference genomes at a mean coverage depth of about 36.6 X for the male and 47 fold for the females. And as you can see, we still have some uh, gaps that we have not been able to map. And there are some of these gaps are known, and some of these gaps are, uh, are probably unique to these Malay populations, as you can see uh, in, in, in the yellow uh, represented bars here. So in terms of the variants, uh, there are different numbers. All three variants, all three variant callers, managed to call more than 5.5 million of variants from the two individuals. But GATK managed to call the most numbers. And in order for us to produce one of the highest quality and, and, and variants of high confidence here, we decided to take only the consensus set of variants uh, from the three programs. So the end result is that we have a consensus set of about 5 million uh, variants, genetic variants from the two locals. So what we did next was to take the 5 million variants from the WGS and compare against the genotyping variants from the remaining 39 individuals. In total, we managed to find about 5.24 million of short variants from these 41 individuals' local malaise. And of this, about 18,000 of them are non synonymous coding variants. And we then compared the variants against the DB SNPs and managed to find that. Out of the 5.2 million, about 183 of them, 183,000 of them, are actually novel. They, they, is, they are not found in the DB SNPs. We also compare these SNPs against the variants from Singapore and Malaysian Malays. In Singapore, they have recently sequenced up to about a thousand Malay individuals. What else? the number of the Malaysian Malays are much lower. So when you look at this, we actually found that about 852,000 of the variants are actually unique to Brunei that they don't share with either the Singaporean or the Malaysian Malays. 
We also, after that, compared, analyzed the variance and found the number of uh, missense, stop games, stop loss, and friendship uh, variance as well. Next, we look at the density of the variance uh, spread across the genomes. And when we look at the, the SNPs and indel density, we can find certain regions in the genomes that are very dense in the variants. And we found that uh, many of these uh, variant dense regions actually fall on immune related genes, uh, uh, which is not surprising at all. Um, and for the CMVs, we also managed to discover in total about 1,200 CMVs and some of this we, we found that they actually contain genes that may, be, ha that may have an impact on diseases such as obesity, cancer and Alzheimer's disease. The next thing we did was to take the variants and annotate them against various databases to try to find the significance of these variants. And we were able to find a number of SNPs that are actually that have been associated with potential genetic risk factors for common non-communicable diseases found in Brunei, and they include diseases such as a heart uh, attack, uh, high cholesterol levels, different type of cancers, and diabetes. Interestingly. We also found a number of SNPs that have recently been reported to be associated with severe respiratory conditions in COVID-19 patients. For example, the SNPs that fall on the splicing site of OAS1 genes is found to be present in quite a high allele frequency in our population. The second things that we did with our WGS data of the two to some individuals was to look for potential novel sequences in the Bruneian Malays. So we took the AMAP read from the humans and mapped them against various microbial genomes. And then we took the AMAP reads from this microbial genome mapping exercise and mapped them against the novel sequences from the Chinese and the Japanese uh, genomes. Uh, we also then did a de novo assemblies and we took all these novel sequences, the so-called novel sequences, and we do further analysis on them. In total, we found about 227,000 base pair of novel Bruneian sequences, consisting of about 146,000 base pair of sequences that are highly similar to the novel Chinese and Japanese context, plus about 800 81,000 base pair of sequences that have not been reported in the human reference genomes. And within these novel sequences, we actually found an open reading friend that is encoding for a novel human homologs of a primate's small zinc finger proteins. This particular open reading friend has not been found in the human gene, in the human proteins as seen in, in the blood search result here. With the finding of the novel sequences and the different number of variants among the Malays in Southeast Asia, we believe that there, there are sufficient difference among the Malays groups. So what we did next was to take 22 different Asian ethnic groups, mainly from Southeast Asia, and did a population's uh, com uh, principal component analysis and admixtures analysis. And as you can see, the Bruneians uh, Malays actually form uh, unique clusters here and the, the, the uh, proportions of the ancestry genetic components are also different from the other Malays groups in the um, Southeast Asia. So we, 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 we believe that the, the Brunei Malays, although highly similar to other Malays group, are actually different uh, from them. And thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, the works that are presented here mainly are done by my students, Mirza Asmi, and, and we are also looking for graduate students and postdocs. For those who are interested, please do get in touch. Thank you.
All right, thank you, Luzen. Um, I hope you're ready uh, to answer questions. Uh, Prash, you had a question? You have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Asif. Yeah, uh, thank you, Zen, you know, for the uh, you know, for a wonderful presentation. I was just wondering, you know, when you looked into the minor allele frequencies uh, or, or the global allele frequencies, I mm -hmm. think, you know, they're pretty high, you know, um, they're not uh, uh, par with uh, either, either the minor allele frequency of 0.05 or even 0.1. So I think you know this is not as per the standard operating procedures. Is there any specific reason that you consider those uh, global allele frequencies? Is it just because you know you also had a matchup with uh, the genotyping the SNPs as well? Is that the reason? Uh, yeah. So the reason is because first of all, um, I think um, our data set is pretty small, and um, so the data set is we we didn't generate those data set. Yeah. So um, at, at the other reasons that we, we want, we, we actually purposely set it slightly higher uh, than, than what is conventionally accepted as a minor LA frequency. Uh, so that, um, because this is just a first, uh, our initials look into the genomics. So we didn't want to miss too much of the, of the, uh, uh, the variance as well. So that is actually one reason. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not it's not just uh, uh, a bit high, but I think it's way too high, you know, as 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 far as I understand. I mean, I could even see, you know, from that particular slide, even yeah. point, point three, point four, yeah. which is probably way very high, you know. Yeah. So, so which means, you know, you find all the common most variants that you probably find you uh, find in probably you and me, and who yeah. knows, you know, even if we try to compare with all the primates as well, even with monkeys as well, you know, you'll find those particular uh, SNPs. No fair point. Fair points. I mean, I, 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 I think you have a fair point there. So, um, yeah, I, I think because um, it's very much just a, a trial exercise for us at the moment. Um, so, I, 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 I will take it into consideration what you say. Um, um, and we will, we should really filter out more of them. Yeah, and one last point, uh, if I may ask if, Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's a great work. You know, seldom you know we find whole genome sequencing. Uh, done you know for uh, such rare genomes i would say when i say rare genomes you know coming from brunei Darussalam, you know uh, comparing it with you know malaysian uh, you know mm -hmm. counterparts and all so maybe it's always a good idea not only to look into the so-called structural variants that you are looking into like you know the copy number variants but also look into the nitty gritties of uh, uh, the genetic variation that is sitting in the non-coding regions as well that's because you know from the whole genome spectrum, that's where you know you could really find the best genetic variation you know that you could see in the in, in the in the in the in the non-coding chunks. And, yeah. and and who knows, like, you would really find that variation of Brunei that is yeah. um, matching with you know those uh, yeah. you know Malaysian you know counterparts. Thank the, you so much the, you know, for the great work. Yeah. The reasons that actually, if I if I may explain. Uh, the reason that we we uh, look into we focus on the uh, coding variance when we do the uh, uh, comparisons is because um, if if you look at our data set, so uh, we have only two WGS data and the rest are genotyping data and those genotyping data mainly are falling on the coding regions and and because of that we are constrained with what is available and. And hence, at the moment, we, 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 uh, the analysis just focusing on that. But we do have a plan to, to expand the study so that we, we have more whole genome uh, sequencing data. And then we can do a, a more uh, comprehensive approach uh, suggested uh, by you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Zen. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Prash. Thank you, Luzen. In the interest of time, uh, we'll move on to the next talk. Right. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Luzen. All right, so uh, next we have a poster presentation entitled Machine Learning Approach to Predict In Vitro Efficacy of Human Lung Ad Adenocarcinoma Proliferation Inhibitors. This is by Laim Abdul Ghafoor and Aisha Gul Yildiz. Uh, uh, Mihan, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my poster presentation. Uh, as the name suggests, it's about machine learning and cancer. Supervised machine learning, uh, it's one of the most common and classical machine learning types, as the name suggests. Uh, it's supervised in the sense that the data is labeled, it's ready. We feed the data to the machine learning algorithm, 
Uh, and the machine learning algorithm usually draws connections between the input and output features. So if this was an example of uh, house prices, for example, this is an easy analogy. Uh, we have a list of houses, uh, the number of the rooms, uh, the quality of the air in that area, uh, the safety of the neighborhood, and the age of the house, and then we have its price. Uh, so when we feed this data to the machine learning algorithm, it draws connections between these independent variables and the output label. Uh, so when we take a house with certain features that was not in the training data set, the machine learning algorithm could make predictions of how much this house could be worth. Uh, this is useful, obviously, because if we could predict something uh, without much effort, it gives us an advantage. And so now that we know all the things we need to know, uh, what we did in this, uh, in this poster. Uh, so we retrieved 25,000 compounds that are known to exert some uh, anti-proliferation activity on A514 in cell lines. Uh, we labeled the data, compounds that had IC50 values above 8,000 nanomolars, so are labeled as inactive. Uh, 8,000 uh, there is no uh, silver line to what consists as active or inactive, uh, but we took 8,000 as inactive threshold, uh, because obviously uh, 8,000 is high enough to have uh, serious side effects. Uh, and we label compounds that are 2000 uh, that have IC50 values of 2000 nanomolars or lower as active. Uh, this is significant. Low concentration, if a compound have uh, IC50 in this range, they are usually drug candidates. Uh, in between, the compounds that were in between were removed to create a buffer zone. Uh, so if there is, it's hard to draw the line between 2000 nanomolars and 2001 nanomolar. So if we give, uh, it increased the bias in the model. So we made a buffer zone, compounds that are in between were completely dropped out. Uh, and also we uh, use negative log, uh, logarithmic transformation on the IC50 values. These are transformers. Uh, for statistical reasons, it's useful to do, uh, but it have uh, no impact because we could convert our results back to IC50 for our evaluation. Uh, also, compounds that have IC50 values below 2000 nanomolars is quite rare, and the number of uh, compounds in this range is also low, because obviously we are expecting more uh, non-ideal drugs than ideal drugs. Uh, to balance the classes and reduce the bias in the model, we use a method called a synthetic minority oversampling, uh, also smooth. Uh, it's not the ideal method to deal with this problem, but it's among the most common, most frequent, and it's the best options we have, let's say. Uh, and then we calculated 300 features for each compound in each data set. Uh, right now we have actually one data set. Uh, 300 features, by 300 features I mean uh, the number of carboxylic group, num uh, the molecular weight of the compound, uh, number of halogen groups, uh, number of double bonds, uh, number of aromatic uh, rings, uh, so on and so forth. We have 300 features for every compound. Uh, we also divided the data set into 19,076 compounds for the training and 2,384 for tests. So the training is the, the compounds that we gave to the machine learning algorithm to learn from, and then we use the remaining test to test it. Uh, our results, we had four, uh, five, uh, five models that we have tested. Among them, random forest was the best performing one. Uh, we also made a uh, 10-fold cross-validation to make sure that there is no bias in the, uh, and it's not overfitting, uh, the model is not overfit. So what we did is we divided the data set into uh, 10 parts, in each, uh, in, and we made 10 total training. So in each training uh, iteration, 10% uh, of the data set is re retained for testing, and the remaining 90% is used for training. The next one, the next 10% is retained for testing, and the remaining 90% goes for training. Uh, we calculate the accuracy from each round, we averaged it, and the average was 90.46%. There was standard deviation of 2%. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity were 99.24 and 98.66%. On the left, you could actually see the confusion metrics. Uh, so left is the two labels, the correct labels of these compounds, and below is the ones that were predicted by the model. Uh, so 1,183 compounds that were actually inactive were correctly predicted. 1,176 compounds that were inactive were correctly predicted. Uh, unfortunately, none compounds that were active were predicted to be inactive. Likewise, 16 compounds that were inactive were predicted as active. Uh, all in all, it's actually a great model. <coughs> I mean, it has uh, almost 90% uh, accuracy. Uh, we know that maintaining cell, purchasing cell, uh, cell lines, maintaining them, uh, and culturing, testing compounds on them is extremely expensive a step. Uh, moreover, you also need labor costs because you can't, and not everyone is suitable for that job, and you need professionals to do it. Uh, this cost actually goes quite high if you have, for example, 100 compounds that you think that one of them could potentially be a drug candidate. Uh, testing all 100 could really be expensive, and the advantage that these models make is you don't have to test all the 100 compounds because you can make predictions on their IC50 values and maybe select the top 5 or the top 10. Uh, this could extremely reduce the cost of the project. Uh, and this was actually a simple model, so it's, uh, it's classical machine learning with uh, non-algorithms. Uh, and imagine if we are trying something like uh, graph convolution models or deep learning models, we could expect uh, even higher accuracies than this. Uh, yeah, that was my poster. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or if you want to reach out for the model, uh, you could email me anytime. I, I will be glad to help you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Have a nice day. All right.
Thank you very much, Naeem. I hope you're ready for questions. Any questions to Naeem from the floor? The judges, do you have any questions? All right, so I have a question for you, Naeem. Um, so just, just to make sure that I understand, um, you used machine learning to take existing data and see whether you could discriminate those that are more effective in terms of you know, uh, inhibiting uh, human lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, so, so the results would already be there. Um, you, you, you're actually just discriminating the IC50 values. Is that right? Uh, uh, yes, actually. Uh, so uh, usually it is similar to the concept of QSAR models. But in QSR models, we are looking for the inhibitory effect against a specific enzyme or a receptor. What we did here, we said that if any compound inhibits this cell line in vitro, I want to know what that compound is, and I want to know at what concentration it inhibits 50% of the cell. And so our, my output was that IC50 values, and then the input was the name of compounds. I calculated 300 features for the compounds, and for the IC50 values, below 2,000 nanomolar active, above 8,000 inactive. Uh, I see 50 values, uh, it's actually negatively correlated. So lower I see uh, 50 values means I could kill more cells with low concentration. And in pharmacology, low concentration is always good because you will expect less side effects from using less active compound. Right, but typically if one was to just look at the IC50 value, are you saying it's not easy to kind of, you know, make that discrimination? Of course, the, the extremes might be easy, but there's a boundary in the middle and your model kind of, um, uh, kind of you know, showcases or identifies that boundary effectively. Uh, okay, so your question is, instead of a classification model, why didn't I go for a regression-like model? Because predicting the exact IC50 value would be more uh, reasonable. Uh, that is correct, uh, yet it has another issues. Uh, in this experiment, we are looking for the efficacy on the cell, not on a particular enzyme or a protein. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's say compound X inhibits uh, cells at this concentration. We know that it, uh, it gives us an idea of, okay, it inhibits it, but how does it inhibit it? Uh, this model doesn't answer the nanoscale question of, what the compound does, what it is interacting with to achieve that uh, low IC50 values. Uh, this model aim was more, uh, actually the final goal of this model was to build a web a platform for different cancer cell lines. So instead of uh, going for QSR or molecular docking or even in vitro assays, you can have a simple portal where you just uh, copy paste the smiles of the compounds you are planning to test and it will just give the results as active or inactive. So it's a precursor study for a study you're planning. All right, all right, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next uh, speaker. We have uh, a post, another poster presentation, uh, genotypic, entitled Genotypic Characterization of Salt Tolerance in Rice by Shanalin Joyal and Wenga Desan V. Nihan, uh, please go ahead. A warm greetings of the day. I am Jay Shanalin, a postgraduate student from Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru College of Agriculture and Research Institute, Karikal. I have come up with a poster presentation displaying the findings of my research work under the title Genotypic Characterization of Salt Tolerance in Rice Genotypes. Considering the salt stress being the second most important constraint in the tropics has devastated nearly 1 billion hectares of the land globally. Hence, combating this salinity stress requires a great understanding of knowledge that underline the salinity tolerance in rice. With a view to characterize genotypically, the experiment was laid out under normal and saline condition in CRD design with three replications in glass house using hydrophonic system. The DNA was extracted and investigated with a subset of six rice genotypes with three salt tolerant genes, namely SKC1, SKC1B, and SKC2E. The amplified product was sequenced in Eurofin Genomics Private Limited Bangalore and subjected to bioinformatic analysis. 
so regarding this skc it is an important physiological parameter used for efficient evaluation and selection of plant material and it is found to encode a sodium transporter that helps control the sodium ion and potassium ion homeostasis through unloading these sodium ions from the xylem coming to the results of the research the skc1 sequences of the selected rice genotypes were compared with the sequences of the database through blast n analysis the blast n displayed 93.16% homology with the varisa sativa japonica group sequence for skc1 and 94.76% homology for skc1b gene and 92.16% homology with skc2a gene The physiochemical properties of the protein sequences using the tools like ProteRAM, Smart and SOCMA showed that the tolerant genotypes namely Pokali and FL478 showed distinct physiochemical properties for the SKC genes with that of the susceptible genotypes namely IR29. The transmembrane prediction of SKC1 protein using THMM tool resulted in distinct differences for a number of domains between the salt tolerant genotypes namely Pokali and FL478 with that of the susceptible genotypes. While these two SKC1A and 2B protein revealed variable number of repeated domains among the salt tolerant and Hello, my name is Ibrahim. Before I A warm greetings of the day. Did we continue from where, where from where it left off, or did it finish? Actually, it finished. Yeah, this was the last part. Ah, okay. All right, uh, Shanalin, are you ready for some questions? Um, yes. Right, sir. So, any questions for her? Anyone? Judges, um, participants. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, actually, I couldn't understand the uh, result part because uh, not enough of these graphs were visible, even if it was zoomed. In. So could you just tell me if uh, what what was the actual influence of your study? Okay. Uh, did you hear that, Shanalin? Yes, sir. Um, I yes, sir. I heard that, sir. Actually, this this work is mainly based on characterization of the salt tolerant genes. So, am I audible? Yep, yep. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So, uh, for characterizing, we have used six sub uh, six subset of uh, tolerant both tolerant both salt tolerant and uh, susceptible genotypes. With this, we have carried out. Uh, we have extracted the DNA and we have. Uh, Uh, analyzed using bioinformatic tools so uh, basically we started using blast analysis to see the percent homology with the uh, other uh, other species so with these uh, during analysis of blast we have found that nearly 93.16% of homology with skc1 so basically to speak with uh, this skc genes are nothing but shoot potassium concentration so it is important uh, you, you take a rice um, when we take rice uh, it uh, it uh, it normally it takes both the sodium and the potassium ion in the salinate condition so with uh, particularly this gene skc gene with the uh, chromosome uh, it has a particular uh, uh, like what we say uh, it has uh, it has ability to uh, transport this sodium from the xylem vessels so i have concentrated with this gene so next uh, we have done the pad uh, pad blasting analysis with this pad blasting uh, pad blasting analysis i have found uh, nearly uh, the, the number of variations between the subset of uh, tolerant and the susceptible genotypes under study and also uh, not only that we have also analyzed is using physiochemical properties like how is the tertiary structure and what is the uh, like what is the uh, number of amino acids etc so um, that we also predicted the three dimensional structure using the swiss modeling so this uh, three dimensional structure revealed the distinct shapes of the tolerant and the susceptible genotypes under study so not only that uh, keg analysis which is nothing but to 
to find out the genome pathway or like uh, where it is this particular skc gene is associated with the gene family or how it is functioning in the signaling network using this analysis we have uh, found that this particular skc gene is having high similarity with the uh, gene called hkt which is nothing but high affinity potassium transporter so with these findings we have bought new insights uh, new insights into the mechanism of this gene skc that's all sir right. thank you thank you shana uh, sorry uh, shana lind thank you very much uh -huh. okay so with the, in the interest of time uh, we will move forward but a quick comment uh, i think this the, the poster is really very difficult to read so you may want to look into that and and the pictures um, yeah it, you could have zoomed in and zoomed out when you were giving the presentation so you may want to look into the graphics um, and the text. It's very wordy for future presentations. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. okay sir. Thank Moving you, on sir. to the next one, uh, we have an oral presentation entitled Predator, Predicting the Impact of Cancer Somatic Mutations on Protein-Protein Interactions by Ibrahim Barber, Chesim Elton, and Hilal Kazan. Uh, Hilal, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Ibrahim. Before I start, I would like to thank Organizer Committee for establishing this event. I'm honored to be invited and give my presentation here. Today, I will be talking about our computational tool called Predator, predicting the impact of cancer somatic mutations on protein and protein interactions. An existing challenge in cancer genomics is to distinguish between driver mutations and passenger mutations. We know that driver mutations contribute to cancer development, whereas passenger mutations do not. Identifying which mutations promote to cancer progression is essential for oncological studies. There are many methods which rely on the frequency of the mutated genes across cancer patients. However, in our project, we consider specific mutation effects. We focus on interface mutations and predict which interactions to be disrupted. An interface mutation, as the name suggests, is occurred in the interface region of the protein it may or may not have an impact on interaction between its partner. We use two different data sets. The first one is Intact Influencing Network. This data provides us information regarding the protein with, it, with interface mutation, the mutation position, meaning that which amino acid changes to the other, at which position this change occur, and a set of proteins that participate into the interaction. Also, we know that whether a given interaction is a disruptive or non-disruptive one. The second data is TCGA cancer mutation data. We gather these cancer data sets for several cancer types. We define an interaction as a triplet consisting of protein, mutation, and interactor values. For each interaction, we use Elastic Web Server to retrieve the features. There are features uh, sequence-based, uh, structure-based, and energy-based. Using the collected features, our goal is to build a machine learning model, train it on the training data, which is intact data, and then use it to identify which interactions will be disruptive in the cancer data sets. So this is a binary classification problem. 
Before we give all the training data into the model, we perform something called protein sampling. So when we look at the training data in detail, we realize that entries with the same host protein usually result in highly correlated features. So why this is a problem? Well, let's say that we want to evaluate the performance of the model and separate some validation data. In this case, these two bottom rows may in the training set and the highlighted entry may be in the validation set. Since the features have very high correlation, this would result in inflated scores in our cross-validation. As a remedy to this problem, we sample only one entry from each protein. So at the bottom, uh, our sample training data consists only unique proteins. There are 164 such rows. Since this sampling involves some randomization, we repeat this process 50 times. Consequently, we obtain 50 different sampled training data. Then we split them into train sets and test sets. For each pair, we train a random forest classifier. We ranked features based on their importance. We do this part for each sample training data Sharp method considers the contribution of each feature on the label. Uh, the Sharp summary plot on the right combines feature importance with feature effects. So how many features should we use? To answer this question, we compare top 5 features, top 10, top 20 and so on Based on this figure, we see that we achieve high score when we use top 10 features. In other words, words um, instead of using all features, we obtain better balance accuracy when we use top 10 features, as highlighted in orange. By the way, we mainly consider F1 scores and balance accuracy scores since in our training data, uh, we have unbalanced class distribution. Then we aggregate those uh, top selected features, top 10 features. Each model has different top 10 features. We looked at their occurrence and aggregate them. On the right, you see the aggregated version. We hyper-tune the models and eliminate the bad models, the models which perform uh, worse compared to others. And here we see the overall diagram of our algorithm. At the end of the day, we get an, an assemble voting classifier. We use this model on cancer datasets. For each interaction, uh, our assemble voting classifier produces class probabilities. So we aggregate these individual probabilities and predict the classes based on median value. For some cohorts, we get more disrupting interactions and for other cohorts like BRCA uh, there are more non-disruptive interactions. On the left we see the total number of interactions. Lastly we analyze our predictions on cohort level 
For example, for breast cancer, we looked at statistics regarding several genes. We found that gene PIK3CA uh, generally occurs in the interface region. Also, in 120 patients, this gene disrupts at least one interaction. For TP53, at least one interaction is disruptive among 52 patients. We found that these genes usually have high mutual exclusivity with its partners. We repeat this analysis for other cancer types. So in a nutshell, we develop an assemble classifier. This model can identify disruptive interactions in cancer. Our analysis reveals interesting patterns at gene level across um, cancer cohorts. You can access the codes in this um, GitHub repository. With that, I want to extend my gratitude to my advisors, advisors Dr. Uh, Hilal Kazan and Dr. Jason Artan for their support. Also, I want to thank all my colleagues in Machine Learning Lab. Additionally, this um, project is funded by uh, Health Institutes of Turkey. Last but not least, I want to thank you for all your attention. If you have any questions, you are more than welcome. Thank you, Ibrahim, uh, for that clear presentation. Uh, so we are happy to take questions for Ibrahim. Anyone? You may type, you may raise your hand, or you may speak. If there is no question, I can ask one. Yeah, go ahead. Ibrahim, uh, did you, uh, are you there first? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear. Ah, okay. Ibrahim, did you uh, compare this tool with the others in the literature? There are several of them checking for the predicting of impact of protein protein interactions. So did you compare your tool with the others in detection of the, those interactions or defections? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so many studies in the literature, they generally tries to uh, find something called delta delta g value so this is free energy uh, change and based on that energy change they try to classify it whether it disrupts its interaction so they uh, frame the problem as a regression problem whereas we more focus on the uh, a classification, but there are also some studies that uh, does the classification, but um, the major limitation in our study, we use uh, Elastic Web Server to retrieve the features. So in order for us to compare the, uh, the findings with other studies, we have to retrieve the features, but we cannot do that uh, for many interactions. So that's why we, for now, we couldn't uh, able to compare our results with other existence methods. Okay, I understand. So you uh, propose a new uh, technique here, as far as I understood. So it's better to do that, maybe use another service, uh, take some help from people. Thank yeah, well, actually we are planning to do that because since we know that which features contribute the most in the disruptiveness of an interaction, if we could retrieve those features uh, without relying on uh, another, uh, just one source, uh, maybe we could enhance the training data size. And this will also allow us to obtain better classification performance. And maybe we can also compare with other uh, studies in literature. Can I ask a small question? Yeah, um, yeah sure. Uh, maybe I missed that, but have you calculated any accuracies, for example, based on the train set, test set, so the results on the test set, do we have that kind of result? Uh, yes, actually we do uh, 
two different uh, evaluation techniques. First is uh, as a traditional way of uh, splitting the data into two, 20% uh, uh, reserved as validation data, and in the remaining 80%, we build the model and assess the performance. Um, since uh, we had actually 50 different uh, training sets, we do that for, uh, we do the accuracy calculation for all those 50 data sets, and we had an average of around 70% accuracy. So the other uh, way of calculating is at the end, we get an assembled classifier. We also measure that performance. So for that, we use uh, one div out, one div uh, out cross validation technique. So we had 164 entries. So we remove one of them and train the model on the remaining one and try to predict what would be the interaction for the, inter uh, uh, the one that we have hidden from the model and assess the performance. Uh, we focused on balanced accuracy uh, generally, and we get around uh, 0 0.69 or something in balanced accuracy. Okay, thank I you. hope this addresses uh, your question. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Brahim, uh, for that explanation. We move on to the next uh, uh, speaker. So next up, we have a poster presentation entitled Network Analysis of Antibiotic Resistant and Virulence Genes in Acinetobacter bomani A8, 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 AB030 for the Identification of Hub Genes by Joshua, Steve, Abhish Abhishek, B, John Burrito, A, uh, Mohan Rajvi, and Vigneshwar Ramakrishnan. Nihal, please go ahead. <laughs> A very good morning to everyone present here. Today, I'm going to present network analysis of antibiotic resistance and virulence genes in Acinetobacter baumannii AB30 for the identification of hub genes. Our team include myself, Joshua C. Abhishek, John Brito, Mohan Raj, and our guide, Dr. Vigneshwar Ramakrishnan. Getting into introduction, antimicrobial resistance refers to the ability of the bacteria to resist the effects of antibiotic drugs that are commonly used to treat them. The pathogenicity of an organism and its ability to cause disease is determined by its virulence factor. These virulence factors are genes that encode proteins that are involved in pathogenesis. In this work, we aim to explore the crosstalk between AMR and virulence of the multidrug resistant and hypervirulent Acinetobacter baumannii AB30 strain. The crosstalk is deciphered based on the interaction network between resistance conferring and virulence genes, which may in turn shed light on the hub genes. The hub genes may then be used as novel drug targets. Getting into the methodology, Acinetobacter baumannii AB30 strain was obtained from Patrick database. There were a total of five variants of AB30, and we chose the Indian isolate for the study. The genes annotated AMR uh, were taken from CAR database and the genes annotated as virulent were taken from BFDB and Victor database. This is a, resulted in a total of 48 AMR genes and 17 virulent genes that total to a 65. And after deduplication using CD hit at a threshold of 70%, uh, uh, the result of 48 genes were retrieved. The interacting partners of these genes were obtained from string using a confidence score of 0 0.4, resulting in an identification of 186 nodes and 996 edges. The encode in cytoscape was used for clustering analysis and network analyzer module was used to obtain the degree distribution of the nodes. The top 10% of the nodes with highest degree were considered as hub genes. The, getting into the results, the list of interaction partners at confidence score of 0.4 from string can be viewed in this QR code. The node degree analysis revealed that the minimum degree was 2 and the maximum was 34. And the degree of distribution showed that nodes have a majority between 5 and 10. As you can see from this graph, which indicates the degree range and the number of nodes, it was found that the majority of the nodes were found in uh, 5 to 10 degree range. The table here lists the hub genes and their functions. The AIL 79116.1, a histidine kinase protein, 
which is a two component system had the highest degree of 34. Now, based on these hub genes, uh, we analyzed uh, the various interaction pathways and uh, we retrieved six uh, shortest pathways that uh, contained AMR and virulence genes. This uh, figure uh, two uh, shows the relation between AMR genes and virulence, use, uh, which contain hub genes. Now, the orange indicates the virulence genes and the blue indicates the AMR genes. The uh, white font is the hub genes. Getting into the conclusion, in Acinetobacter bombana AB30 strain, we have identified the uh, network of interactions of virulence and AMR genes. The hub genes from this network were identified and AIL79116, a histidine kinase protein, showed the highest degree of 34. It must be noted that this is an histidine kinase protein, which is a two component system. We have also identified the crosstalk between virulence and AMR genes. And there was a total of six hub genes involved in this crosstalk between including AAL79116.1. Hence, this protein may be considered as a novel drug target in drug designing. And thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, I hope you're ready for questions. Questions for Joshua, anyone? Anyone? Okay, if no questions, I have a question for you, Joshua. Um, I didn't hear you talk about, how does your result compare with what is already known about a uh, AB30? So actually, when you see it uh, uh, here, actually uh, they have uh, taken uh, the known antibiotics that have been experimentally proven uh, that are resistant, and uh, we are trying to find a connection between uh, this uh, virulence and the EMR. Uh, now, uh, what is actually being shown here was uh, when you can uh, suppress one of the these interacting pathways, it is possible that the antibiotic resistance can be stopped and thereby increase the antibiotic efficiency. No, what I mean is with regards to the hub genes, did you, uh, are you the kind of the first one to look into this? How does it compare with other reports out there? Um, sir, uh, we are the first ones uh, that were actually trying to find uh, the, suppress the antibiotic resistance using hub genes. Sir. Okay, but maybe you're the first one for AB30, but what about other other strains of uh, Acinobacter bomani? Oh, no, sir. Uh, others? Uh... No? Okay. You didn't find any similar studies? Uh, um, no, sir. Studies? We didn't find any uh, similar to objects um, like we have done. All right. Okay. Any other questions for Joshua? No. All right. With that, uh, thank you, Joshua. We move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, so the next one is also a poster presentation uh, entitled "Comparative Evaluation of Binding Affinities of Peptide Ligands to HLA-B Alleles Differentially Associated with Type One Diabetes Mellitus (T1DM)." This is by Peshala Amara Jiva, Aslihan Ozkan, Penra Ozbek Sancha, I hope I got it right, Malgor Zata E Garashka, and Onur Serchinoglu. Thank you. Inihan, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Peshala Amara Jiva. I'm a master's student at the second affiliated hospital of Xi'an University in China. I'm going to present our current research findings on comparative evolution of binding affinities of peptide ligands to HLA B alleles differentially associated with type 1 diabetes mellitus. Type 1 diabetes or autoimmune diabetes is a chronic autoimmune disease. Destruction of pancreatic beta cells causes reduced insulin production in the body and higher blood glucose levels. Type 1 diabetes is associated with human leukocyte antigen or HLA. 
HLA region is a highly polymorphic region in the genome encoding vast diversity of HLA molecules. HLA class 1 molecules are hyperexpressed on pancreatic beta cells. HLA class 1 molecules present diabetogenic peptides at the surface of pancreatic beta cells for immune surveillance by CD8 plus T cells. Upon the recognition of MHC class 1 peptide complex by specific T cells, CD8 plus T cells destroy the presenting cell. However, mechanistic studies on how HLA alleles affect T1-DEM risk are limited. We aim to identify features of HLA class 1 alleles that modulate their association with autoimmune diabetes. We considered three alleles that show differential autoimmune diabetes association. HLA-B3901 and HLA-B3906 have been identified as predisposing alleles and HLA-B3801 as a protective allele. Our main objective was to decipher how this differential association relates to peptide binding properties. We employed a fully computational approach. First, we generated three pools of random peptides of different lengths, 8 months, 9 months, and 10 months. Each peptide pool contained 1 million peptides. The generated peptides were predicted how well that they bind to selected 3 HLA class 1 molecules using NetMHCPAN 4.1 web server. The threshold value for strong binders was assigned as 0.5% and for weak binders 2%. The distribution of peptide binding affinities was examined by generating affinity distribution histoplots. The positional conservation and variabilities across predicted binders for selected alleles were examined by generating sequence logos using sequence 2 logo sequence logo generation tool. In table 1, we can see the number of identified strong and weak binders. The highest number of binders was identified in the nine-meric peptide pool compared with the other peptide lengths. We found narrower binding affinity distributions for ligands for predisposing alleles HLA-B3901 and HLA-B3906 than protective allele HLA-B3801. We also observed significantly lower mean binding affinity of peptides binding to HLA-B3901 and HLA-B3906 than to HLA-B3801. These data suggest that the type 1 diabetes predisposing alleles bind peptides more strongly than type 1 diabetes protective alley. In figure 2, we can see this sequence logos that show the conservation or variability in the sequences of predicted binders. We can appreciate that P2 and P omega positions are highly conserved when compared with other positions. Also, histidine exhibits a higher frequency at the P2 position in the HLA-B3801 binding motif when compared with the other two alleles. This is especially apparent for 8 months and 10 months. This data suggests that type 1 diabetes predisposing alleles bind a more diverse peptide repertoire than type 1 diabetes protective allele. I showed you that type 1 diabetes predisposing HLA class 1 alleles can bind peptides stronger and present a more diverse peptide spectrum than type 1 diabetes protective allele. This suggests that the disease predisposing alleles may be more permissive in peptide selection and bind suboptimal peptides. Such suboptimal peptides presented locally at the higher dose may contribute to the autoreactivity of CD8 plus T cells. Thank you for your attention. I will now take questions. Thank you. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Peshana, uh, for that interesting work. Uh, we are happy to take questions now. All right, so the, you have a question there, Peshana. Um, why did you choose only three alleles? Is there a relation to T1, DM, or you choose, chose randomly by Farooq? Actually, uh, when considering uh, T1, DM, uh, it's associated with uh, this uh, HLA or human leukocyte antigen region. And uh, when considering the HLA uh, region, it's a highly polymorphic region and like express uh, uh, vast diversity of uh, HLA class 1 alleles. 
so there are a lot of hla class one analysis but uh, we choose this hla b3901 uh, hla b3906 and b3801 because uh, limited uh, studies has been carried out uh, for these three alleles uh, because of that we choose uh, these three alleles all right uh, thank you i i have a question um, i mean um this is interesting. I do a lot of work on this uh, actually stuff. So um, besides the binding, you know, to more diverse, so the, the more con the protective one is, you know, binding to less diverse peptides and less optimal, whereas the other ones, um, uh, you know, the disposing ones are binding to much more diverse and stronger. Um, is that um, anything to do with the, was there any, like anything in terms of the antigens that were binding, uh, because you use a huge repertoire of peptides. Do you think um, you know could be the type? Could the type of antigens matter here, or it doesn't really matter? It just it's kind of weird to make that connection. You know, it's binding to a whole range of antigens, and then he has a yeah, protective yeah. or uh, disposing uh, attribute uh, to to T one DM. How do you make that connection uh, yeah. to the audience? Uh, actually, uh, when considering about the uh, antigens, uh, we can uh, say like uh, this uh, predisposing, when we consider considering the predisposing alleles, HLA B3906 and uh, B3801, uh, these alleles uh, most of the time uh, prefer to uh, bind with the, uh, which has the uh, histidine. Uh, amino acid and uh, several other amino acids. But when uh, considering uh, B3801, uh, it has uh, the affinity to bind with peptide, uh, which has a histidine at T2 position. Uh, but uh, when considering the predisposing alleles, uh, it shows like uh, binding affinity to uh, bind with uh, the peptides, which has uh, other amino acids at T2 position. Because of that, my, uh, I my, sorry, my question was more with regards to the antigen because I'm, I think you're looking into self peptides binding to the HLA, not so much about pathogens binding to the HLA here, but rather self because HLA binding also involves self peptides. So I was just wondering whether there's a particular type of you know recognition of these self antigens that kind of breaks down or has has, has some effect in terms of protecting or disposing. Actually, I, I don't have idea about that. Sorry. All right. Anyway, uh, all the best and something for you to think about. Okay, moving yeah. on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have an oral presentation, uh, Microbiome Net, uh, entitled uh, uh, Microbiome Net Finding Taxonomical Biomarkers in Human Microbiome. This is by Amhar Jabir, Burchu Bakir Gungur, and Malik Yusuf. All right, Nihan, please go ahead. Welcome everyone to my presentation. Uh, I'll be speaking about microbiome net, a tool that is used to find taxonomical biomarkers in human microbiome. My name is Amar Jabir and I will be your presenting author for today. And first we will speak about our agenda. As you can see, we'll first speak about the human microbiome. And then we will speak about the, the data sets related to our tool and the preprocessing steps we used. And more after we'll be talking about microbiome net, our tool, the results that we obtained, and finally a compar comparison against classical machine learning approaches. As you all know, microbiome plays a huge role in the human uh, life. Uh, it's uh, known to regulate uh, the immune system, it regulate uh, uh, our gut health, also in some cases has been reported to regulate our mood as well. As you can see the study by, led by Castello that the microbiomes are in many places of our body and they diversify greatly in different parts of our body. For instance, you can see the different types, uh, different diversity of different types of bacteria in different parts of our body. And one of the ways that we can understand or learn about different bacteria in different parts of the body is using something called uh, Sequencing. Uh, mainly we use shotgun sequencing because we can find a uh, great amount of uh, bacteria from a single uh, sample. Basically, we test ag against different types of bacteria. So as you can see in the study, which gives you uh, quite uh, 
brief overlook on how the process starts. We take the microbiomes from a sample, and then we will extract the DNA, and then we send it through the sequencing. We have, uh, in our study, we mainly focus on taxonomic profiling, and uh, in the future studies, we plan to work on gene and function profiling. And we take the, uh, we get the sequencing read, and then we taxonomically profile it, and then we get the, each from each taxonomy, we get the relative abundance or the absolute abundance. In our study, we work mainly on absolute abundance. In, uh, as you know, most of the bacteria are basically classified in different types of uh, hierarchies or levels, the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, and genus, and species. So I think this is one of the basic building blocks of bacteria, and this is one of the basic uh, grouping component of bacteria. We thought of uh, integrating this biological domain data into a machine learning approach. This is our whole basis of our approach to using machine learning with taxonomical data. So our raw files were processed using Metafan 2.02, and it's mainly used to find taxonomic profiles of different types of bacteria from the raw sample files. And as you can see over here, this is our tool microbiome net, and this shows you an overall picture of how our tool works. First, we have our input data sets, we have samples in our rows, and we have species in our columns, an N by L data set. And then you can choose the uh, text level. For instance, we can choose where we want the uh, kingdom or the phylum or the class or the order. And as you can see, for instance, if you choose the genus level, we can we get this example. For instance, we group by genera, like genus. And then we get, for instance, we create a group called uh, acnobaculum group. And then we get all of these bacteria under that group. So for, then this bacteria is created as a group. So our, the same way our, the way our tool works is that our data sets is split into train and test set, and then we use the t-test to find the most significant features. And then we rank each group, as we mentioned over here for this example, we're just taking a group by genera, and then we create a group called uh, Acnobacillum, and this will be ranked. And from this, all the different types of genera in this data set will be ranked, and then we find the best K groups. And from on the best K groups, we take this best K groups and then we test it according to our test set, where we again train based only on those test groups. And then we analyze our performance. All this is run normally with 10 full cross validation, as you can see over here. Uh, as, uh, one, as according to the literature, we found out that uh, colorectal cancer, type 2 diabetes, and inflammatory metabolic disease shows uh, correlation between. Uh, Healthy and disease samples, as well as the uh, as well as the differences in the healthy and disease samples, disease uh, samples. So that we use these three diseases to find uh, to find specific biomarkers that can help in identifying these diseases in clinical settings. We, as you can see over here, you can see the number of samples, the patients uh, which are uh, labeled as pos, and uh, healthy samples are labeled as neg, and you can see the amount of samples for each and the amount of species uh, in each data set. Similarly for type 2 diabetes, and it's metafion 2 tool to profile it and it uses, uh, uses relative abundance. Uh, processing of data normally, after we use uh, metafion tool, we get, the data set in the, uh, we get the data set in this following format. But as I mentioned before, in our microbiome net tool, we then uh, we use only the samples in our rows. And we get our classes, which we uh, label positive and negative uh, based on disease sample or healthy sample. And here we have our species. As you can see, normally we do get until only levels of, for example, kingdom archaea. But we made all of our species to the level of species. And for our results, we focus on three main uh, hierarchies, the order, family, and genus. The reason we choose these three hierarchies is because we do not want to macroscopic views by focusing on kingdom. We won't give us any biological relevant data. This gives us a huge, uh, huge sample of uh, species. Similarly, we don't focus on, uh, on the smallest amount, for example, uh, species, since uh, it will give us single species, and most of the studies show that there is co-dependency between uh, different types of bacteria. Therefore, we choose uh, order feminine genes. As you can see from our results, based using accuracy, sensitivity, specificity in ARC, we get it about. Oh, I think we had a hiccup. <laughs> okay. Uh, Amhar, are you still there? Mm -hmm. so we'll keep mm -hmm. going, okay? Yeah, sorry about that. 
Have a good day to everyone. I'm Nihan Sultan. I'm a researcher at Bezmal and Vakuf University, Bekos Institute of Life Science and Biotechnology. I'm working at Molecular Biology Lab with Dr. Metin Rafiki. I will be host for this parallel session. I would like to announce housekeeping messages regarding our symposium. To ensure a smooth running of the session, please make sure you have access to a good Wi-Fi or cable internet connection. We kindly request that you change your Zoom profile name to your full name to ease name tracking for attendance purpose. The sessions uh, will be live stream on YouTube, so you can uh, go back to Zoom, the main room, and uh, continue with YouTube after we finalize our breakout rooms. Please join our Discord server for announcements and other communication. If you have any technical issues, kindly of seek help through the chat box or email to us. If you would like to ask questions to our speakers, please type them in chat. I would like to welcome to our chairperson for this session, Dr. Muhammad Erkan Karapekmez, and our two honorable judges, Dr. Saliha Eja Ajunar and Dr. Onur Emre Onat. I would like to confirm whether all the judges have the form to judge. At the end of the presentation, there will be two minutes for Q&A session. So from now on, I will hand over the platform to Dr. Muhammad Erkan Karapekmez. The floor is yours. Thank you very much.
Um, thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, I hope uh, all of the so uh, authors presenters are here. You can't hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Dr. Okay, so okay, I, uh, I'm, I'm proceeding. I, I, I can proceed now, okay. Hang on, Nihan, can you hear? Just to be clear. Nihan? Ah, sorry, sorry, okay, yeah. So. Okay, oh, yeah. is it okay? Are we, are we okay now? now? Yeah, 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 so yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, I hope all the presenters are here. Uh, again, welcome to the last parallel sessions of our symposium. Uh, have a nice session. Let's proceed with the first poster presentation by uh, Nanda Rizkia Pradhana uh, Ratnasari and uh, Ganda Putri Maya. I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, Ardana. Uh, and their study is comparative study of K-means, K-medoids, hierarchical clustering, uh, density-based clustering, and distribution-based clustering methods on stunting cases in uh, Indonesia. Uh, let's proceed. Hello everyone, in this opportunity, I would like to present and share a result of a research conducted by my team by the title Comparative Study of K-Means, K-Medoid, Hierarchical Clustering, Density-Based Clustering, and Distribution-Based Clustering Method on Starting Case in Indonesia. There will be three different parts within this discussion, which are introduction, methodology, and result. I will start with the introduction. This is the objective of my study, which is classifying provinces in Indonesia based on the stunting prevalence level. This is the background of uh, our study. Uh, based on the information provided by World Health Organization, Indonesia is at the fifth rank among countries in the world regarding stunting prevalence level. And also because Indonesia has few problems related to the related to malnutrition in children. And based on this information, you can see that the prevalence or the percentage of stunting in Indonesia increased from 2018 to 2020. Even though the percentage just increased 1%, but if you multiply this percentage, which the total number of population in Indonesia, obviously the number will be quite high. That's why uh, we all want to classify the category of the level of stunting over provinces in Indonesia. I will start with the discussion about clustering. Actually, clustering is an analysis or method used to classify the data or objects into different groups based on the similarity of the data. And then this is what we did during the research. We got the data from the Central Bureau of Statistics of Indonesia and the data that we took was the stunting prevalence over 34 provinces in Indonesia. The, the data was taken uh, from 2015 to 2018. And the software that we use is RStudio. And these are uh, the method that we conducted during the analysis, which are, men which are mentioned in the title. K-means, K-medoid, theoretical clustering, density-based clustering, and distribution-based clustering. And then the result that we got provided within this, uh, this slide, you can see from the table that uh, in general, the number of provinces uh, between the high and low level of stunting uh, actually different if we uh, use the different method of analysis. But the number of high and low stunting level actually uh, quite similar. You can see uh, the distribution actually similar but the difference might happen in the density-based clustering method, which are the number of provinces with high level of something uh, is higher compared to the low level. But for the other, the other method, actually the number of provinces in the high mm -hmm. level of something is less than the low level of something. And then this is the result actually that we got from the software. If we want to classify the data or make a category of the data into two different uh, classes, which are low level of stunting and high level of stunting. 
actually uh, we got that uh, the number of province between high and low level uh, quite similar there is no difference between the number of province between these two level of stunting because based on the t-test analysis the p-value is uh, equal to 0 0.9352 which mean uh, there is no uh, statistical difference between the number of province both uh, in the high and low level of stunting and based on this uh, information you can see that uh, when we use different type of analysis the result or the category or classification of each actually there are few province still have the same category no matter what method that we use, such as Aceh, you can see here with a different type of data, or sorry, different type of method, the results always end up with the same thing, which is uh, end up with the group one. Also similar to the West Nusa Tenggara, East Nusa, uh, sorry, West Borneo, Central Borneo, and a few, few other uh, provinces. But uh, overall, in general, when we conduct different type of uh, method, the group or category or class uh, for each process will end up with a different category. Okay, and then that's it for, from our uh, analysis. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do we have any question? Uh, from the judge or from the audience, do we have any question? I can ask maybe a little question. Uh, okay, please. Is Nanda here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, okay, and uh, thank you for the presentation. So what is your main conclusion maybe I guess you couldn't find differences between the uh, provinces, right? Yep. Uh, what is your conclusion or can you change your data set or what is the novelty maybe? Can you comment on this a little bit? Yeah, uh, so from this research actually, I wanna find how many how many provinces that belong to the low level of stunting and how many how many percent of the province belong to the high level of, of uh, stunting level. So by comparing the percentage, uh, I really hope that uh, this research can provide kind of uh, information to the government about the level of, of stunting in Indonesia that so they can do something to improve the yeah, malnutrition in Indonesia. So that's the main objective of this research actually. But as you can see from the presentation that actually we haven't finished everything. Obviously we need to check uh, like in like finding the location, exact, uh, exact location because the prevalence, uh, the data about prevalence only go from the province. However, sometimes uh, the different district also provide the different values. So maybe for the future research, we want to check more detailed information about that. So not only about the province, we can also get information about the standing level in the district level. So that's the answer. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, uh, we can proceed with the next uh, presentation, uh, yeah, which is, um, Again, another poster presentation by uh, Ishirjan Chandok and Mukul Sharma and uh, Pushpenda Singh. Uh, the title of the study is Leprosy Information Tool. So actually we didn't receive their uh, presentation video, ah. so we can just skip this one. Okay, 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 uh, my bad. Uh, we will uh, move to the third uh, presentation, which is an oral presentation by uh, Asia uh, Bukhamla and Nabiha Azizi and Samir Brahim Balhuari. Uh, the title of the presentation is Deep Learning Based Approach for Cardiac Image Interpretation Case Study Study of VGG 16 and ResNet 20. Okay, we can uh, proceed. Good morning. First, I would like to present myself. My name is Bukhamla Asia. 
I am a PhD student in Artificial Intelligence at the Belgi Mukhtar University of Annaba, Algeria, attributed to the LabJet Laboratory. So today I will do a presentation about the research work entitled Deep Learning Based Approach for Cardiac Image Interpretation, Case Study of VGG16 and ResNet20 Algorithms. Let's begin with presenting the main points that we will be focusing on today. First, we begin with an introduction about the main concepts in this work. Next, we will talk about the VGG16 and ResNet20 classifiers. After that, we move on to the experiments and results. Then we proceed to the discussion. And finally, we conclude the presentation with a conclusion. In recent years, machine learning techniques have been integrated into the process of making medical diagnostic support systems to improve the efficiency of automated diagnostics. The traditional approaches of machine learning have achieved promising results in the medical decision support field. Their only drawback is the necessity of manual feature extraction, which is called handcrafted features, and which requires a prior knowledge on the field of application. Deep learning is a set of machine learning methods that is based on artificial neural networks with multiple stacked layers. So, advantages of deep learning against traditional machine learning techniques include that they do not require a lot of domain knowledge for the problem at hand, nor any explicit feature extraction step using human experts. Deep learning has been widely applied in medical imaging tasks such as pattern recognition, image segmentation, image compression, and image data augmentation. In this research work, we will focus on the pattern recognition imaging task. Convolutional Neural Network, or CNN, is a deep learning algorithm that is so been most popular used for analyzing images. The term convolution in CNN denotes the mathematical function of convolution, which is a special kind of linear operation wherein two functions are multiplied to produce a third function, which expresses how the shape of one function is modified by the other. In simple terms, two images which can be represented as matrices are multiplied to give uh, an output that is used to extract features from the image. There are two main parts to a CNN architecture, a, convolutional, uh, a convolution tool that separates and it identifies the various features of the image for analysis in a process called as feature extraction, a fully connected layer that utilizes the output from the convolution process and predicts the class of the image based on the feature extracted in previous stages. VGG16 is a simple and widely used convolutional neural network architecture used for ImageNet, a large visual database project used in visual object recognition software research. VGG16 architecture is an improvement over AlexNet, wherein it replaced large kernel sized filters with multiple three multiple three kernel sized filters one after the other and it is composed of 16 layers resnet 20 is also a convolutional neural network that is 20 layers deep it is one of the variants of resnet residual networks the two algorithms are convolutional neural networks the only difference is in their architecture where the order of the convolution and pooling layers changes. So the aim of this work is to study the impact of the feature extraction phase on the learning rate of the chosen model and to interpret cardiac images for the detection of heart diseases. In this research work, the two architectures, VGG16 and ResNet20, were applied on three cardiac imaging datasets obtained from Kaggle and Mendeley containing different imaging modalities such as MRI, ECG, and CT. The first dataset is CAD cardiac MRI dataset with 42,915 samples. The second one is ECG 
images data set of cardiac patients with 928 uh, samples and the third one is image data set for a CNN algorithm development to detect coronary uh, atherosclerosis in coronary CT angiography with 5959. In all the following experiments, we will name the first data set MRI data set, the second one is ECG data set, and the third one is CT data set. VGG16 and ResNet are pre-trained on the ImageNet dataset, so in our experiments we have used the transfer learning to gain time and to improve the accuracy. We have also integrated the data generation step for the augmentation of the data. The table below shows the accuracy values of VGG16 and ResNet20 with the datasets. As shown in the table, we can see that VGG16 have achieved the best results for MRI and ECG datasets and the same accuracy for CT dataset. The results of the two models are promising, are promising with MRI and CT datasets, but for ECG uh, dataset results are a little bit poor. Here are the loss and the accuracy curves of VGG16 and ResNet20 on MRI dataset during the training epochs. These curves are for ECG dataset and these curves are for CT dataset. This research work is the first work that applies VGG16 and ResNet20 deep learning architectures on these three datasets so there is no previous works to be compared with our results. Results of VGG16 outperformed those of ResNet20 because it is composed of big number of layers and it requires more epochs for training even if it is pre-trained. And results of ECG dataset are not good because it is a small dataset, it needs steps of data augmentation. As a conclusion, in the present, ECG dataset must be augmented for giving best results and the ResNet20 algorithm must have more epochs for the training phase. Other deep learning architectures can be used with these datasets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any question? from the judge or from the audience. Hi, Asya. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, did you try to Thank compare you. it with other data sets like VGG19 or uh, previous versions, whatever? No, actually, I just uh, tried to apply VGG16 and ResNet20, and I have uh, changed the parameters. I have changed a lot of parameters, like uh, number of epochs or data uh, inserting data augmentation step, but uh, the best results are uh, mentioned in this presentation. I didn't try it over uh, versions of VG, uh, VGG. Okay. Maybe it's, it could be possible to compare which G16 between the 19, so you can find a, a better correlation between a similar data set. Yeah, yeah. The main of this study is to, to compare the, the, uh, the impact of the feature extraction, uh, the feature maps uh, step in uh, deep learning architectures. In this, um, in this study, we have uh, compared VGG16, which, which has uh, 16 layers, and the ResNet with uh, 20 layers. And uh, the, the order of uh, layers is also not the same, convolution and pooling layers. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, I can add a small question, uh, if I may. Um, uh, for the data sets you use, uh, is there any other uh, results with any other tools with the same data sets, or uh, is that you the first time you analyze the data set? 
actually is the first time uh, to use these uh, three data sets. With okay, these so uh, the, architectures. The data yeah. sets are uh, analyzed for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, the, these uh, three data sets are, uh, are, uh, uh, are added uh, in a few months on Kaggle and Mandalay sites. Yeah, okay. for example, uh, CAD data set is added uh, for, uh, in three months. Okay. So Thank there, are, there are no studies on these uh, data sets. I didn't find a uh, lot of studies on these data sets. Thank you. Do we have any other question or we're gonna proceed? Uh, Nihan, uh, the previous uh, presenter is uh, putting a comment on chat box. Did you check? Uh, do we have the representation or we should proceed to the, for the next one? Yeah, we checked the chat and we have already answered the question. So we can go through with the second, uh, the next one, next presentation. Okay, uh, we are presentation. proceeding with the poster presentation yeah. by uh, Simon Preet Kaur and uh, Parakashan Sharma. Mm -hmm. uh, the title of the presentation is the shifting functional role of uh, microsatellites uh, enriched genes in Arahis species. Uh, let's proceed. Thanks, everyone. My name is Simon Preet. I'm from uh, Guru Gobind Singh Indraprasad University, Delhi, India. I'll be presenting my poster entitled Deciphering the Functional Role of Microsatellite Enriched Genes in Arrakis Fishes. So let's start with the basic introduction of microsatellites. These are the microsatellite term was first coined by Little Little Lutie in 1989. These are tandemly repetitive DNA elements which are one to six nucleotide long and also known as SSRs and STRs, that is simple sequence repeats and short tandem repeats. These are actually very hypervariable in nature, which may, which is mainly due to polymer slippage, in which DNA polymer slips off strand of DNA, uh, which increases or decreases the repeat unit. So uh, for this study, we uh, selected four arachis fishes. I hope it's visible. Four arachis fishes. Uh, there is. Arrakis monticola, Arrakis hypogea, which are uh, wild and cultivated respectively, allotetroploid species, and uh, two wild their two wild and ancestors, Arrakis duronensis and Arrakis epensis. So uh, we, we retrieved the sequence from the NCVI database, their FTV server, and uh, we identified, screen, and mine the microsatellite using Python-based uh, desktop application that is great. And um, based on this, uh, we uh, uh, mine microsatellites as um, mono, di, tri, tetra, pentra, and hexa repeats. The abundance um, then the abundance of microsatellite was then calculated and functional in, uh, in their in genomes as well as in their chromosomes. Functional enrichment of microsatellite enriched genes was done using Blastogo server. Five. The Arrakis genome range from 1 uh, GB to 2.5 GB almost, and uh, almost two la uh, 23 lakhs microsatellite were observed in uh, Arrakis species. So uh, the abundance of microsatellite was calculated. This graph here shows the comparative plot of uh, comparative analysis of presence of microsatellite in Arrakis species and Arrakis monticola had the highest genome size and number of an abundance of microsatellites. And further, here, uh, uh, this graph here shows the comparative analysis of abundance of microsatellite in genus Arrakis. Uh, this is the abundance and uh, Arrakis monticola succeeded in uh, abundance as well. Further, uh, in the respective chromosomes, microsatellites were mined and uh, so when we compared uh, chromosomes on the basis of their abundance, so when we compared chromosomes of Arrakis species on the basis of their abundance, it showed that among all species in chromosome A8, um, it uh, showed a different pattern when compared on the basis of uh, 
genomes, uh, the chromosome size and uh, the, the abundance. So uh, the chromosome size was high and uh, was more uh, greater in a, of A8 chromosome, whereas the abundance was very less. Further, uh, their uh, uh, mortis was analyzed among, uh, for example, monodietary mortis were analyzed in arachal species, and it was observed that uh, AT rich repeats were A uh, um, sorry. AT rich repeats were predominant in all species, especially in A8 uh, chromosome A8 of Arachis monticola among dinoclarid repeats. AT AT repeats were mainly predominant among chromosome dinoclarid repeats. Chromosome A10 and chromosome B6 of Arachis monticola represent most number of AG and CD repeats. Um, Dinoclarid repeats AAT and ATD were very specific to Rakis Monticola. The um, this statistical analysis was done uh, using R Studio. Correlation analysis of abundance of microsatellite in their chromosome size was done, and Arakis Duranensis uh, showed different observation, but uh, all other species sh almost shows uh, showed uh, no correlation. But here. A negative correlation was observed in Arachis duranensis when compared on the basis of their chromosome size and abundance. Here, figure 6 uh, show, shows the pie chart which indicates the present uh, a percentage of different cell parts group in the category of biological processes, cellular component and their molecular function. The functional analysis revealed potential role of microsatellite in dephosphorylation of DNA RNA polymerase, protein uh, phosphorylation, very, and uh, it also performed various other metabolic processes. Uh, also, for biological functions, uh, the genes were mainly involved in microsatellite and rich genes were mainly involved in ATP binding, protein diathionase activity, and uh, uh, various other binding activities. Well, this also perform various other cellular, uh, cellular component in uh, arachis species. So with this, uh, this present study clearly indicates the present occurrence of microsatellite changes with the change in genome size, type and priority of the genome. And also the abundance of microsatellite would not uh, necessarily correlate with the occurrence of microsatellite in these genomes. Uh, as as uh, we saw, the abundance was negatively correlated in arachis duranensis. That's why. Also, the functional analysis of microsatellite and which reveals poten reveal the potential role of microsatellite in transcription, translation, and various binding activities. Uh, so these also might be performed, uh, might also, these also might be involved in performing various other biological functions. Uh, okay, thank you for the presentation. Do we have any questions? Uh, is the presenter in the breakout room? No. Uh, Dr. Samir Preet Kaur, uh, are you here? Okay, I think the presenter is not here, so uh, we can skip the questions and uh, continue with the next presentation, uh, which is an oral presentation by uh, Bilia uh, Buana and Paul uh, Mireji. And the title of the presentation is Annotations of Novel Antenna Expressed Genes in uh, Malaglossina Morsitans, Morsitans uh, Tsetsefilias. Uh, okay, Nihan, we can proceed to the next. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. I don't know if any of us has ever had an insect bite before. They make you very uncomfortable and they're usually painful. Like three months ago, I had an insect bite when I was in field work in the coast of Kenya. And it was really painful because that part of my body was so swollen and I felt like I was run over. So I could wish that I could get an experience of each and every one of you if you have ever had an insect bite. So welcome to my presentation entitled Annotations of Novel and Unexpressed Genes in Maglucina Mosita and Mosita and Sesaflies. I'm Bilia Kamunto Buana from Kenya. Sesaflies are primary insect vectors for 
trypanosomiasis or what we call human African trypanosomiasis and animal African trypanosomiasis and human language sleeping sickness in Nagana respectively. So this is a flies being among them the Glossina mosita and mosita. They are widespread in about 36 of southern African countries where 70 million people are at risk of contracting this disease and we can see that we have been having cases even to 2018 and when you look at the agricultural sector that it has cost about US dollars 4.5 billion dollars per year so this disease means to be a burden in these affected countries and uh, the effort to eradicate it is almost next to impossible hence the management of this disease has been majorly hinged on the vector control which is the control of the sensor flies sensor flies both the female and the male are exclusively hematophagus and they transmit the trypanosomes that cause this sleeping sickness and agana to the respective host while obtaining a blood meal. So these sensor flies exhibit a very unique feeding behavior in that they are able to distinguish a suitable host from an unsuitable host in order to obtain a blood meal. So the chemical kills all what we call the odors that emanate from these hosts are the ones that guide the sensor fly on which host is suitable and which is not. So this odor cues can be sweat, can be urine, can be breath, among others. And we can we can say that the major olfactory appendage that is involved in navigating the presence of these chemical cues in the environment is the antennae. And when we go deeper to be very specific is that the process is mediated by antenna expressed genes. So from previous annotations of the sesophila genomes, because six of them have been annotated among the, the glossina mosita and mosita genome, a number of chemosensory genes have been annotated, but they were annotated in regard to the transcriptions that were existing at that time. So we have seen that there have been a deficiency in obtaining organ-specific transcriptomes especially for this antenna in the previous work that has been done. Hence we hypothesize that if we get an organ specific transcriptome especially for the antenna, we can be able to annotate, identify and annotate genes that have been missed from the previous annotations. Hence our study we aim at establishing gaps in the annotation of the antenna expressed genes in the Medgrosina mositan mositans to annotate and create genes associated with these gaps and to establish transcription responses of novel genes associated with this. In our methods and tools is that we had a group of sesaflies that were exposed to different treatments where one group was unfed, another group was unfed and exposed to a repellent that is delta nonolactone, and another group was unfed and exposed to a an attractant that is epsilon nolactone. So we obtained antenna from this, each sesafly in these treatments and extracted RNA and went ahead to sequence them. Then we did preliminary uh, cleaning process of these reads that we obtained from the sequencing before we went ahead to do the mapping so that we can establish the gap in the annotations of the genes in this sesafly. So we went ahead and did the the, the first step we did was to cl the cleaning process. Then we went ahead to do the mapping against the genome and against the transcript so that we can identify the presence of, we can establish the presence of that gap. Then if from that process, we were able to extract the unmapping reads. Those that were not mapping to the transcripts and assemble them into putative transcripts where we use these putative transcripts to generate gene models and manually annotated and curated these gene models into complete or partial genes and also identified the fu their functions and if they were differentially expressed in in, re in, re in regard to the treatments that these sesophiles were exposed to. So in our quality check of our reads, we were able to establish that our reads were of good quality as you can that more than 98% of the reads survived the cleaning process of which 94 were paired. So you can see two graphs where one is for the where we did the claim for the individual libraries and one where we had pulled the libraries together. So we pulled the libraries so that we can increase the depth of the coverage of the reads in the downstream process. So both shows that our reads were of good quality, hence we went ahead to do the mapping. We mapped our reads into the genome and transcripts of the GMM, that's the Glossina mositon sesafly. And as we can see that a good number of our reads mapped to the genome, that's showing that we the, 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 the reads we had were from the Glossina mositons. And also a good number mapped 
to the transcripts, but there was also another number that was left out that is about 45.21%. So it was showing us that the unmapped reads, they are not contaminants because they are from the gmositans, and also that this trans, this reads, they are corresponding to genomic regions in this CSFLA that have not been annotated. So we went ahead and did an assembly of these unmapped reads where we assembled them into 72,422 unique transcripts among which about 25% had similarity to sequences in the Uniprot protein database and uh, 70, about 74% of them did not have any similar to sequences in that database. So we tended to think that the 74% they were the divergent ones which are still corresponding to genomic regions that have not been annotated. So we also established that our library was, our, our assembly library was very good because we can see that more than 96% of the mapped reads were utilized in the assembly. We went ahead and used the divergent transcripts we had assembled to generate gene models using Maker and manually curating and annotating them using Apollo. So we successfully annotated 502 genes of which 202 were novel and 390 were alternative forms. So when you look at this you can see the novel gene and on the other side you can also see, you can also see the alternative forms that we were able to annotate. When you dived into the novel genes, we were able to find out that about 46% of the novel genes had an ortholog, that is around 24 genes, had an ortholog in Drosophila melanogaster in Musca domestica, or a novelus gambi. And uh, we, can find, we can see that a number of these orthologs were cutting across in, that in, in, in an instance that other genes, or majority of the genes, had an ortholog, in the three organisms. So these orthologs were functionally associated with uh, detoxification, protein degradation, metal ion binding, transcription or regulation among others. And we also were able to establish that only one gene was differentially expressed in response to an attractant by about threefold, while others showed also subtle changes in response to these treatments. So in the contribution of our study is that we have added 202 genes to the current annotation of the GMM genome, where 53% are or more assets any similarity to sequences that have been annotated, all the gene sequences, protein sequences that have been annotated in the closest dipteran relatives. And we have also established a workflow for mining and map traits associated with the annotated genomic regions, which it can also be used in other organisms as well. So the fun further functional study of novel genes that we have annotated in this project can help understand the CESA behavior, which can be very much useful in enhancing the CESA control kit that is currently in use. And I'm having faith that if we are able to understand this behavior completely, then we can be able to stop the CESA bite and also manage the spread of African trypanosomiasis. So I could wish to acknowledge the University of Imbo and Kaliro for supporting me through this project and also VectorBase for DL giving me their support in the annotation process and also in providing our genes with IDs. Asante and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, I want to ask the first question. Uh, did you submit your new assembly, the new genome uh, to any database? No, I didn't do the, thanks for your question. I didn't do the assembly for the genome. It has been done before. So I, what I did is to annotate the genes and uh, the, the raw data, I had submitted it to Vectorbase. So if you really need to look at it, then you can contact Vectorbase. They can provide you with everything that I had submitted. Okay, thank you. Uh, now it's uh, more clear for me. Uh, any other questions? I want to ask a question too. Did you do any homology analysis with the new transcripts or genes? Yes, I did. I, I, I used the Uniprot protein database as my reference to do the homology search, where I found that a number of the new genes that are annotated 
they do not have an homolog in that database. So we can, we, I could say with confidence that they are surely novel. That is about 53% of the genes that I annotated that were novel. Okay, I want to ask another one. Uh, uh, your, your genes, your or your tra new transcript seems as a new, very functional one. So, uh, do you look for if they are, uh, reside in a domain or a specific region, functional region in the genome? Thank you. I haven't got to that extent yet, but I'm still continuing with the work. So, it's something that I can keep doing as I finish up. Thank yeah, you. Also, yeah, functional in vivo study is also necessary, but as a start point, yeah, the domain search could be uh, possible, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any other question? Uh, I, I was curious about something. Uh, at least did you search for the uh, one specific gene that was different between this attractant, the experiments with the attractants and not you showed that result right there was one gene uh, significantly different between them so did you check about that gene any annotations function roles sorry will you mind please repeating the question you said that there is one novel gene different between this uh, two experiments you use the attractant and not right did i get it correctly i'm not sure maybe i get it wrong yes yes not correct uh, okay so did you check that specific gene for any functional role or i was curious about that uh I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't done any functional studies on that specific gene because of the limitation of resources in the other part okay. of the world that I am in. Mm -hmm. So probably I can do it in future because for now I don't have the resources to do functional okay. studies on that specific gene. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you don't have any other questions, we can proceed to the next uh, presentation, which is a poster presentation by uh, Sena Atasever and Tuba Arzu Özal Ildiniz. And the title of the presentation uh, is uh, Molecular Dynamic Simulation of Interaction Between Crimean uh, Congo uh, Hemorrhagic uh, Fever Virus Glycoprotein and Epidermal Growth, growth Factor Receptor. Okay, let's go. My name is Sena Sever. I'm a master student in Medical Biotechnology Master Program um, in Ajbadan University. I'm currently working on molecular dynamic studies with the leading of my thesis advisor, associated professor Arzu Tubarzal Ildeniz. Uh, our study that I'm about to present now is on Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. This virus is known to be highly uh, widespread widespread tick-borne related virus and it causes very uh, severe conditions on human health uh, so it is associated with, with high fatality rates due to these reasons examining structural constituents of cchfb provides us information to understand working mechanisms of the virus and the active regions that might be interacting um, with neutralizing or even interrupting agents against cchfb which may be used as uh, a potential therapeutics or they can be used uh, in vaccine studies. In this study, molecular dynamics uh, methods were conducted to analyze interaction of CCHFV secreted glycoprotein GP38, this one, with uh, 13G8 human monoclonal antibody epider epidermal growth, growth factor receptor, and uh, this is the magenta in magenta color. Um, GP38 was, was proven to be uh, the target of protective antibody against CCHFB. On the other hand, 13G8 human, anti uh, human monoclonal antibody is known to be a protective antibody against uh, CCHFB. So uh, we take crystal stru structures of both glycoprotein GP38 and 13G8 from protein data bank uh, uh, database 
uh, they were then arranged to be suitable for their proper interaction of each other by using Discovery Studio uh, visualization tool. Uh, those two rearranged protein structures were located against each other um, at a 20 angstrom distance here, as, as we can see it in here. Um, by using VMD software, Visual Molecular Dynamics software, uh, these pictures are taken from that uh, software. Then the two protein system was solvated in water box, uh, but right now you, uh, you cannot see the water molecules because uh, we eliminated the water molecules from the visual to be able to see the proteins clearly. After system was solvated, simulation parameters were set up, uh, such as temperature was taken, as 310 Kelvin and pressure was set as 1 uh, ATM. Particle, particle mesh evolved, um, grid sizes were set according to the system cell basis vectors. The simulation length was set to be 5 billion uh, steps long and also minimization process was included uh, set as 5,000 steps long. Simulation consists of uh, 5,000 five and five numbers of frames. Um, duration of the simulation also set as 10 nanoseconds. Uh, molecular dynamic simulation of the properly arranged system uh, were run on uh, NMD software. Uh, this is nanoscale molecular dynamic software. Uh, these all molecular dynamic um, tools um, run by using uh, high, comp high performance computers. Our results shows that CCHF is secreted analog glycoprotein GP38 and human monoclonal antibody epidermal growth factor receptor 13G8 attached to each other at approximately 550,000 step of the 5 billion step long simulation. And we can see it in here how they attach to each other uh, and remain attached except for a very brief moment in which they detached at nearly 4 billion step. Uh, uh, we can see it in here, I will be mentioning soon. Uh, this short break is not considerable. Um, by looking at these outcomes, it can be said that these two proteins uh, interact with each other with high affinity. Um, also, we generated bond frame graphic that you can see it in here, figure three. Uh, the interacting molecules blo belonging the two proteins are attached and equilibrated at 550th uh, frame number here. Uh, we can see it in the graph. Um, but then detached at approximately uh, 4,000 frame for a neglectable duration, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, even though this short break neglectable, when we look at the um, uh, ending steps of the simulation, molecules represent immoderate fluctuation. Uh, that's why simulation may need to be extended to see if the bonding uh, would reach an equilibrated state continuously. Um, we also generated an RMST time graph, uh, which we can see it in figure four. Uh, this is also shows that whole system is also in imbalanced behavior. This graph generated for whole system, by the way. Same concerns and possible solutions about bond frame outcomes can also be applied for RMSC time graphic outcomes. As a result, even though you know, some minor considerations has arisen, it can be said that GP38 and 13G8 um, are promising agents for therapeutic studies against CCHFB. Nevertheless, they, they should be further investigated because of these um, issues. Uh, we, are, we are remaining our studies on these two proteins to obtain more consistent results if you have any questions i'll be trying to answer i will I, i'll be trying to be answering them as much as i can in q a session um thank you for listening thank you very much um do we have any questions i can ask one please hello sena are you there Sena? The presenter is not here. I think she is in the room. Sena, can you hear us? 
I asked her to unmute. Yes. I think she's not here, right? Okay. Um, let's proceed. Then that's something new. Uh, we have more audience than presenters. That's new for me. Uh, let's proceed to the next uh, presentation, uh, which is another oral presentation by uh, Mikey Nurmalasari and uh, Setya Pramana. And the title of the presentation is Comparison of Random Forest and XG boost uh, approaches to classify invasive uh, ductal carcinoma and invasive lobular carcinoma. Let's proceed. Hi everyone, my name is Mika Normalasari. I'm from Health Information Management Department, Universitas S. Anggul Indonesia, and my collaborator research is Setia Pramana from Polytechnic Statistica STS Indonesia. We will present our research with title Comparison of Random Forests and XGBOS Approach to Classify Invasive Ductal Carcinoma and Invasive Lobular Carcinoma. And this is the outline of our presentation. First is introduction and then method, then result and the end is conclusion. Introduction. The definition of breast cancer by Center for Disease Control and Prevention is the disease in which cells in the breast grow out of control. Breast cancer can occur in any part of the breast, but it's more likely to be found in the ducts and labels. Infansive breast cancer is breast cancer that has spread in the surrounding normal breast tissue. The most common kind of breast cancer are infansive ductal carcinoma or IDC and infansive lobular carcinoma or ALC. Ductal breast cancer start in the cell that line the milk ducts and lobular breast cancer start in the cell that line the, no the levels. Gene expression and profiling and machine learning algorithm has been used to help breast cancer classification and predict the breast cancer type. This goal of the study is to compare the classification in facet ductal carcinoma and in facet lobular carcinoma by random forest and extibus. The data that we use is come from the study by Edlund et al. It is, it is from Leibniz Research Center for Working Environment and Human Factors. And the research is about gene expression based prediction of neo chemotherapy response in early breast cancer, result of prospective multicenter expression trial. The expression data from NCBR data is set uh, with the code GSA140494 were analyzed. The data set contain 85 samples with two, two more types and around 54,000 genes. Okay, now we're going to the methods and this is what we have done. Uh, first, we do the pre-processing data by using gene filtering. And then the second one, we use LIMA. This is linear model for microarray data. And then two algorithm are used to classify the infancy breast cancer. Uh, and those are random forest and extreme gradient boosting or ST boost. Okay, the first method, we do gene filtering. In this part, we filter feature exhibiting little variation or a consistently low signal across samples. We may decide that there is a little value in considering features genes with insufficient annotations. And we use our packet gene filter in this part. Then we apply LIMA, linear model for microarray data. LIMA is a package for the analysis of gene expression data arising from microarray or RNA sequencing technologies. LIMA provides the ability to analyze comparison between many RNA targets simultaneously. It uses linear models or to fit linear models and find differentially expressed genes. And in this part, we use our package LIMA. 
Then the next step, we did the random forest. In this part, we build a number of decision trees on bootstrap training samples. Each time a split in a tree is considered. A random sample of M predictors is chosen as split candidates from the full set of P predictors. And in this part, we use our package random forest. Then the last, we apply XGBoost or Extreme Gradient Boosted Trees, and it is an example method. XGBoost repeatedly build new models and combine them into an assemble model. We use our R package XGBoost, and for the illustration, we can see from the, di the diagram in this slide. We start with the initial models and then calculate error from the previous models. And we build the models for predicting errors. And then we add the last model to assemble. And we go back to the calculate error from the previous model and we do it again for many times. Okay, and this is the result. From the first step, we did the gene filtering. From the original data set, we have around 54,000 genes. And after we remove the gene with the low variation across samples, or we removing the genes with insufficient annotation, we end up with the 10,000 genes after filtering. And this is the result from Lima. We have volcano plot in here. Volcano plot of 58 differentially expressed genes with adjusted p-value less than 0.1. We can see from the graph that the gene of CDH1 and LNC00993 are highly this one and this one are highly significant and have high fault chains. Then we perform stratified random forests with 10 fold cross validations. And this uh, figure shows number variables against error cross validation. And we got the optimal number of variables with has the lowest error cross validation is 14 top genes. And this is the list of the most important genes, 14 most important genes. We can see that the LIN C00993 in the top and the last is METN3. And we got the area under curve is 0 0.9691. But we compare with the XGBoost, we got the area under curve is equal to 0 0.9941. And after we perform XGBoost, we got the most important genes. We can see from the graph the list of the important genes. The first one is LINC00993 and followed by CDH1. And, and you can see the, the other genes in this graph. And finally, we can conclude that the XGBoost method outperform random forests because the area under curve of XGBoost is 0.9941 slightly higher than the area under curve of random forests is 0.9691. And the most important genes generated by both methods are LINC00993. This gene regulates the cell cycle pathway, and there is also CDH1 that the genes provide instruction for making a protein called epithelial cadherin. And there is GLI3, the, this gene regulates uncouraged independent growth, proliferation, and migration of cancer cell lines. The other gene is the GFB3. 
provides instruction for producing a protein called transforming growth factor beta 3 and the other gene is LOC 153684 this gene is an RNA gene and is affiliated with the lean RNA class and the last is EGOT the, these genes produce a long non-coding RNA molecule and that's all my presentation and thank you okay thank you very much uh do we have the presenter in the room for this one let me check Mieke Nurmalasaria, are you here? Oh, okay, we have already some questions from the audience. Hello? Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Now, now we can hear you, but uh, so uh, weakly. Uh, we have a question from a chat box. Uh, why did you choose this data set uh, or is there a special reason for choosing this data set why did you continue with a single data set do you not apply it a meta-analysis uh, okay i will try to answer uh, yes because uh, this is the new study and and also our interest is in breast cancer cancer study and also for the second one is uh, that's a good idea to perform meta-analysis but uh, it's a uh, challenge to co combine the these several studies so it will be and that's the what is a, a good suggestion for to do the meta-analysis okay i have a question Mikey, thank you for the presentation. Uh, as far as I saw, your differentially uh, significant, the differentially expressed genes are all upregulated. There is no downregulated significant gene, right? Uh, sorry, I can I cannot hear clearly. Can you... Okay, your significantly differentially expressed genes are all upregulated. There, there is no significant non-regulated gene, right, in your data set? Yes, there is up and under graduated. So what could be the reason for that? Yeah, actually, we, we don't haven't checked that. So we will check uh, after, yeah, after this uh, seminar. Thank check. you. Um, I can add a, a small comment. Uh, did you check the uh, the biological uh, output outputs of the uh, submitters of the data set uh, in Geo database? Did you check their uh, biological analysis, the biological results? Did you compare uh, your uh, methodology? Did you find any uh, advantage of your method? Okay, uh, we will we will do in the next or in further further study for gene set enrichment analysis. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Then uh, we can proceed to the next presentation, um, uh, which is from Istanbul Medinet University. Actually, it's uh, my group, uh, Kera Muzala, uh, will present uh, Fevziye Nuran, and I contributed the uh, study. Uh, the title of the uh, presentation is Investigation of Molecular Mechanism of Unclosing Spondylitis by Multi-Omics Data Integration. Okay, Nihan, we can start. Hello, everyone. I'm Kera Muzala from Turkey. I'm a master's student at Istanbul Medeniyet University Department of Biological Data Science. And I'm the presenting author of our project, 
that is investigation of molecular mechanism of enclosing spondylitis by multiomics data integration. And here is, you can see my outline. First of all, I'm gonna talk about what is enclosing spondylitis. Then uh, I'm briefly uh, give you information about what we know and what we don't know. And uh, it's the uh, purpose of our study. And then I'm gonna talk about our study design and give you our results and uh, conclusion. So what is ankylosing spondylitis? It's an autoimmune inflammatory arthritis, uh, causes uh, inflammatory back pain and stiffness. Uh, this disease uh, causes pathological bone, bone formation in the sacroiliac joint and uh, axial spine. And these uh, bones uh, gradually ankylose. Ankylose means uh, they, are, uh, they are becoming uh, inflam inflammated and uh, they are, they are uh, sticking together like glue and uh, this eventually uh, leading to loss of joint function and disability. Uh, what we know about this disease, uh, it's, it's a disease, it's a complex disease that uh, genetics, environmental and immunological factors uh, uh, interplaying and there is a there is a one gene, uh, namely HLA B twenty seven, uh, and it's responsible for uh, approximately twenty percent of AS occurrence. Uh, interestingly, however, uh, only about five percent of uh, individuals that uh, that carries this gene uh, suffer from AS. Uh, there is another gene uh, so far uh, detected, uh, namely EREP1, uh, and the main variant of EREP1 interacts only with the HLA B2 and the 7 gene, and that's how uh, it's it's somehow uh, related in uh, molecular mechanism. And EREP1 is, a, is an uh, endoplasmic reticulum aminopeptidase, and it's, uh, it's, it's a peptidase that, uh, it's an enzyme that, uh, it's an enzyme, and uh, its substrates are uh, MHC1 class, uh, MHC1 class. And so far we know about uh, TNF-alpha, TH17 uh, cells and uh, IL17, IL23 axis is uh, playing, a, uh, playing an important role of uh, uh, occurrence of AS molecular and gene initiates AS. Uh, this is uh, unknown. And uh, why small proportion of uh, HLA B2 and 7 positive people uh, developing AS? Uh, that's, we don't know either. And uh, here is uh, our, uh, our aim was uh, understanding uh, underlying molecular mechanisms better and uh, under uh, system level uh, biological changes and eventually uh, discovering new uh, discovering novel and reliable biomarkers for diagnosis and prognosis and offering a better treatment uh, methods so here is uh, our study design we uh, we begin our we begin our uh, project from the point of uh, systems biology view perspective, 
And uh, here we used multiomics approach. Uh, we conducted some transcriptomic studies, that is namely uh, differentially uh, expressed genes and WCGNA uh, studies. WCGNA is a weighted gene uh, co-expression network analysis. And we conducted uh, epigenomic studies, uh, differentially methylated genes. We found differentially methylated genes. Uh, we conducted uh, regulomic, regulomic studies, and uh, we focus on uh, TF target detection. TF means uh, transcription factor. And proteomics, uh, we conducted uh, proteomics studies. We constructed protein-protein uh, interaction networks. And finally, we uh, combine all these uh, studies in together and uh, created a context-specific network. So our result is uh, we used uh, three different uh, transcriptomic data set and uh, an methylomic data set. Here we can see their accession number from uh, uh, GEO, NCBI GEO. Uh, so these are the numbers that uh, we detect in uh, those uh those transcriptomic data sets uh, differentially expressed genes uh, and here we can see the uh, here we can see we that we detected in met, uh, metallomic uh, metallomic data set differentially methylated genes uh, 1132 differentially methylated genes uh, we detected and uh, 109, uh, 1909 in one uh, in 1909 CPG islands, and you can see we uh, consider p value uh, lower than 0.1, and there is uh, another value for uh, differentially methylate uh, differentially methylated genes namely uh, beta difference. Beta difference uh, measures the uh, methylation level of genes. Uh, we, we took that level uh, greater than 0.2 and you can see uh, the, you can see the uh, distribution of differential methylated genes, hyper uh, DMGs, hippo DMGs, and there is also uh, there are also uh, hybrid DMG, DMGs, uh, aka having uh, hyper and hypomethylated regions in a gene. So uh, those are the those are our uh, results of WGCNA. You can see the uh, here that. Uh, some groups, some modules. Uh, this WGCNA uh, eventually uh, gives uh, gives you a, a modules that uh, uh, and that modules contains genes that are co-expressing, uh, namely uh, meaning that. These genes are uh, co-expressing in uh, certain uh, conditions, and you can see that uh, we found these results and uh, greater modules uh, accumulation. So uh, these are the results result table of uh, WGCNA. And in regulomics studies, uh, we found uh, differentially methylated promoters, uh, that is uh, TSS 200 and TSS uh, 1050, uh, 1500. And, and then we uh, found differentially methylated uh, transcription factors uh, using trust database. 
and then uh, transcription factors binding to uh, differentially methylated chromatids using trust and uh, differentially methylated transcription factors targets uh, using uh, trust database so here we can see the uh, numbers of uh, differentially methylated promoters accordingly uh, hyperventilated or hypometylated and their distribution of uh, either uh, whether they are non-coding or coding we we, uh, we carry on with the coding genes And here we can see the numbers of uh, differentially methylated TFs or uh, differentially methylated TF targets or TFs that uh, regulating uh, differentially methylated promoters. And then finally, uh, we uh, we constructed a PPI network, protein protein interaction network, and then uh, we integrated all this uh, tf data uh, tf data tf target data and transcriptomic data and we used as uh, uh, we visualized this network on a cytoscape prog program and uh, j active modules uh, app of the uh, cytoscape program gave us a uh, top top five highly transcribed network modules and here you can see the uh, our network in this network uh, the shape that is triangle refers to uh, tfs this uh, blue uh, this uh, somehow how can i say uh, purple or whatever uh, elliptic shapes uh, and these orange shapes uh, are differentially methylated genes and those that uh, those shape that coloring purple is uh, uh, tf targets so in conclusion wgcna results uh, show distinct things distinctive groups of genes that are uh, co-expressed and functional enrichment analysis of these uh, WGCNA uh, modules indicated strong relationship with uh, immune system regulation that uh, meaning that uh, uh, co-expressing genes uh, are belong to immune system regulation and uh, at the end of the uh, context specific network, uh, it revealed uh, seven genes, seven novel genes that are uh, highly up or down regulating, meaning up or down, uh, transcribed via uh, epigenetic mechanisms, uh, especially hyper, hyper or uh, hypometallation. Uh, genes that are differentially expressed and differentially methylated at the same time, uh, meaning that uh, uh, that uh, context-specific network gave us, uh, are found to be strong re strongly related with immune dysregulation, and uh, the. Uh, we propose that uh, further val validation of genes and uh, incorporating another omic levels will uh, broaden our understanding of ASS pathophysiology, and uh, this will uh, eventually enable uh, for uh, better treatment methods. And thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any question for Karam? I may ask a question. Yeah, the, your uh, candidate genes are make sense with respect to their biological pathways. And what about ERAP1? The expression pattern of ERAP1. 
Uh, actually, we haven't uh, any significant. We haven't found any significant uh, significant difference in Iraq one. Uh, we we haven't found. I okay. think neither uh, neither in uh, metallomic studies or nor in uh, transcriptomic studies we uh, we didn't find. We, we didn't find any difference in Iraq one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Do you have any this, other? Hmm, apart from this data, actually, I want to ask a question about Iraq one. If do your patients have uh, increased BMIs? Uh, sorry, I couldn't understand your question. Yeah, apart from the uh, study, this study, but I just want to, uh, mm, I wonder that if your patients with AS have uh, increased BMI levels by the mass index. Uh, uh, no, as far as I know, uh, the, they haven't any, uh, there is no evidence that uh, increased BMI for uh, in relation with uh, Iraq one or uh, in relation with uh, uh, developing uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't encountered it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you have any other questions? There's a question in chat box. Um, ah, okay, uh, I just saw, I uh, missed, sorry. Uh, did you comparatively analyze the modules? Uh, we, we, we actually didn't uh, compare the modules of uh, WGCNA, uh, but uh, the, the uh, functional, uh, we did functional enrichment of uh, modules. Uh, but we, uh, we didn't compare it. Uh, we didn't compare it. We, we didn't compare them. Okay. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you, Kerem. I think we don't have any other questions. So uh, Sena had some technical issues, uh, the previous uh, presenter. So I think uh, she's now uh, available for any question. I think Onur Emre Hocam, uh, you had the question to her. If you don't forget the question. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I forget the question. What is the subject of? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, let, let, me, let me ask a, a general oh, question. <laughs> uh, let me so, uh, ask a general question, Sena. Uh, hmm. Do you have uh, any um, uh, further research uh, proposal for your study, uh, what's the next step? Sena, are you here? Uh, yes, I, I can hear you right now. Uh, yes, we are continuing the, our studies about the subject. Uh, we are trying to uh, uh, model the same proteins uh, with the with changing the distance between the proteins and uh, elongate the simulation uh, to obtain more balanced data right now. Then uh, we continue with the um, ligand interaction studies, and uh, we we will look to ligand interaction. Uh, of the same uh, proteins to target. Um, um, you mean uh, computationally or experimentally? Uh, com computationally, uh, we study on uh, molecular dynamics uh, area, uh, but if we find uh, desirable uh, results, maybe we can continue with uh, in vitro studies also. Okay, but thank you. Team, uh... Okay, thank you very much. Um... I, I also had a question about this. 
Mm -hmm. uh, did you consider to start with the doc, doc structure, first docking them together and then start your simulations? Now yes, that you. you have some specific sites, I believe, uh, maybe mm -hmm. you can use them also. So I will... uh, we, we are considering the docking studies, yes, exactly. But uh, we first try to reach uh, more balanced results uh, with the different uh, uh, um, parameters, then uh, mm -hmm. we will continue with the docking uh, experiments. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Numa Sena. Uh, we have two more uh, presentations to go. Um, the one, uh, before the last one is by Gazala Sultan and uh, Saliha Zubair, and their presentation is titled as Biomarker Identi Identification in Ductal Breast, uh, breast Carcinoma uh, Through Gene Clustering and Classification Using Machine Learning Techniques. Okay, let's continue. Greetings to everyone. This is Gazala Sultan from the Department of Computer Science, Elite and Muslim University. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work in the International Symposium on Bioinformatics on Biomarker Identification in Ductal Breast Carcinoma Creating Class Screen and Classification Using Machine Learning Techniques. Looking at the statistics, uh, ductal breast carcinoma has continued to be one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality among female population across the world. So therefore, ductal carcinoma is easy becomes ductal carcinoma becomes becomes life threatening when it develops into invasive ductal carcinoma. And as the statistics says that 20 to 53 percent of women with ductal carcinoma is easy to have high risk of developing into with the increasing incidence rate. It becomes an urgent need for the identification of potential biomarkers at primary stage of cancer development. Several studies have been performed in this regard, yet it is assumed that some of the key markers which majorly contribute to the pathogenesis of cancer landscapes are remained unnoticed. Since machine learning has been contributing greatly to make biomedical science researches, including molecular subtypes, classifications, disease progression, predictions, MRI image analytics. In this study, we have included normal breast tissues and with respect to the ductal carcinoma in situ and invasive ductal carcinoma in situ, ductal carcinoma samples to for the further analysis of gene, of gene expression comparison and identification. Since 3000 BC, the first documented case of tumor of the best were found and treated with fire drills. Over the time, various, various treatment methodologies, for example, mastectomy, mammogram, mammogram and uh, radium-based cancer treatments has been developed in, and in the recent years. And the first clinical trials approved to test CRISPR-Cas19 gene editing methodology against breast cancer cells about tools and methodology. In this study, we have visualized five different data sets comprising of normal, normal samples, ductal carcinoma in situ samples, and invasive ductal carcinoma samples for the, for the gene expression analysis where we have identified, where we have compared normal samples with the ductal carcinoma in samples and identified total 509 differentially expressed genes. And when we compare the genes which are specific to the which are specifically responsible for the development in ductal carcinoma in situ to invasive ductal carcinoma, we found that there are total 312 genes which were responsible in progression of the, which might be responsible in progression of the ductal carcinoma in situ to invasive ductal carcinoma. Furthermore, the common DEGs, which were among both the, the common DEGs for 59, which were identified and followed by the gene regulatory network analysis and for functional enrichment analysis to identify their molecular involvement and biological functions in the breast, in breast cancer samples. Additionally, we have applied the machine learning algorithms to analyze the 
EGs, a pre-trained the gene models which can classify the EGs based on their expression that these genes are which falls in the normal sample category and which falls in the disease sample category. So based on the gene expression levels, we have we have classified the genes in two different groups, normal and the disease. Disease group contains the disease and IDS group. Furthermore, we have uh, we classified the genes and applied seven different machine learning algorithms for the EG validation because we have already identified the common EGs. We had to, we had to cross validate the EGs that we have we are identifying from gene expression analysis, and the common genes which were found were taken for gene regulatory network analysis and from the functional enrichment analysis. The common EGs that we have identified have, has not been going through the network analysis and we have identified that genes are majorly interacting with each other. Most of the genes, as we can see, the network is quite dense. Finally, the, the co-expression analysis of, of the data revealed the 12 genes out of 59 genes were co-expressed with, with, were highly co-expressed with each other. Genes involved in breast carcinoma. According to our results, these genes are associated in co expression with other genes and also expressed in the breast tissues involving FAT4, PLIN4, GPR84, and respectively other genes. Among all these classifiers, only six classifiers showed the highest accuracy, which is 90%, and the true positive rate and the false positive rate for these classifiers varied with 0. Point, between 0. 0.9 to 0. 0.8 and 0. 0.0 to 0. 0.2 respectively. As the accuracy percentage of SMO, SBM, L, Log, East, and J48 was 90%, whereas the accuracy percentage of my base, the receipt, and decision table was 85%. Classification results for six classifiers were used to check their accuracy for correctly classifying the sample types. The performance of accuracy for each classifier of the 10 in 10 folds accuracy is at least where the decision table shows the least accuracy, while the J48 shows the highest accuracy in the classification algorithm. Conclusion in, in the conclusion, the present study at Utilize the integrated approach of bioinformatics bio data analysis and machine learning classification, classification method, method, clustering, and classification of the genes. We have identified the DG, which is DNIP, and uh, other, along with other genes that should utilize in distinguished doctor carcinoma and normal samples. Therefore, these studies genes could be used as a potential gene set as biomarkers to identify doctor breast carcinoma biosynthesis decision table and other uh, algorithms that we have used qualified for further analysis except random forest algorithm and J48 emerged as the best classifier amongst all the classifiers. The results from this study also signifies the highest accuracy result of J48 algorithm the, along with the successful results there are there might be always be some limitations in average study and we have uh, integrated that with the future direction because we, we are in this study we have considered only seven classifiers including SEON, that is the Spiresnet and J4, Renaforest and Decision Table. Therefore, furthermore, algorithm because we have uh, we have used only seven algorithms to classify the data, we, uh, we would expect in, the, in our future work to use further more algorithms that could be applied for the classification of the genes and the cross cross validation could be done to achieve achieve more uh, to achieve more algorithms which can accurately classify the data. Additionally, the accuracy of J4 rate as the best classifier for sample classification may need further validation by using it to the data sets from a broad, broader range of breast cancer samples and other diseases because the list number of samples is only limitation for the for the bioinformation because whatever data is uh, available in our, in the public in the public databases we, we utilize those data alone and we are expecting to utilize more range of data sets and we could identify potential biomarkers as a promising therapeutic targets for the breast cancer thank you for giving me opportunity Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, the enthusiasm of the audience is 
Hi, that's uh, perfect. We have already two questions. Uh, Dr. Zhang Lu asked that, uh, what's your sample size, uh, the number of patients, and uh, any information on the subsets of breast cancer? And also uh, commented that uh, your differential express genes seems to be low. Uh, can you comment on this? Good evening, everyone. This is Ghazala Sultan. Am I audible? Uh, yes, uh, please proceed. Uh, yes, sir. So thank you for the question. First question is, what is your sample size and number of patients? So basically, since we have taken five different data sets, so there were different number of uh, samples in each data sets. Uh, like uh, in total, we can say that there were total 270 samples as each data set containing as 54 sample 30, 82, 42, and 62 sample. So this is quite a less number of samples, I, we understand, but uh, whatever data set, uh, data samples are available, we, uh, because we are doing only computational analysis, we have no uh, facilities of uh, wet lab analysis. So we are uh, accessing the publicly available data sets and uh, we are analyzing those data sets itself. That's why we have mentioned that we, we have to check these accuracy of the module of the algorithms on the larger, broader number of uh, samples. Second is based on the any info on the subtypes of breast cancer. Uh, for the subtypes of breast cancer, we have we have taken two types of samples like invasive ductal carcinoma and uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, where we are focusing on the genes which are responsible for progression of in ductal carcinoma in C2 to invasive ductal carcinoma. So that's how we have targeted this study as of now. Uh, yeah, next is based on the DEG. Yes, the DEGs we have considered are low because we have uh, taken only the common genes, which are uh, which has already like classified uh, from uh, like which are specifically responsible for progression of the disease from carcinoma in situ, ductal carcinoma in situ to invasive. That's how we have, that was the initial aim of the study. And thus uh, also we have targeted on the algorithm, machine learning algorithms, which are classifying the genes correctly. So that's how we have concluded at the final stage, we have taken only 13 genes, which were taken as the target gene because those 13 genes were correctly classified from by the machine learning algorithms as well that which we got as j48 algorithms given uh, best accuracy uh, yeah Next. um uh, dr zanlu added another comment uh, i mean the molecular subtype uh, i think uh, about the subtypes of breast cancer uh, yeah, so in this study, we have focused on ductal carcinoma alone, uh, because other subtypes include lobular carcinoma and uh, other types. Uh, so we have included only those uh, data sets which have uh, the ductal carcinoma and invasive ductal carcinoma samples. So I guess uh, no information for these subtypes. Uh, and another um, question is, uh, is it possible or is it uh, logical to ignore the possible differences between the two types of breast cancer and considering uh, as one group? Uh, I can add myself, uh, why did you get the intersection of differential express genes? Um, I couldn't get that point exactly. Uh, what's the uh, biological assumption behind that? So taking the uh, intersection of two uh, differential express gene groups means uh, you are uh, searching for some common expression for, uh, patterns for two different uh, types. Um, I, I, could, I couldn't get that point exactly. Can you make any uh, further comments on it? So, so it is uh, like while doing machine learning analysis, so we have prepared the model which will be classifying, like we have taken it in two times, like first time it is normal, with uh, DCIS samples, ductal carcinoma in situ samples alone. And then uh, the model will be uh, differentiating which uh, genes are like normally expressed and which are uh, like diseased 
form expressed and then again in the second row we have taken the normal with idc samples so that we can uh, classify the genes in different groups as normal and diseased one because when we are comparing dci uh, diseased one so diseased one samples are already in highly expressed so their expression form is uh, large so that the model is uh, like not able to clearly uh, differentiate between the disease, two different types of different disease samples. That's why we have classified into normal and then disease groups. Um, okay, uh, do we have any other questions? I think that's all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Now we will proceed to the last presentation. Uh, by Jemre Kefeli and Andres Aravena. And their presentation is about novel targets of the VNT beta uh, catenin uh, pathway discovered using gene expression data mining. Uh, okay, let's start. Hi, my name is Jemre Kefeli, and I am a master's student in Istanbul University of Molecular Biology and Genetics. Today, I will talk to you about our quest of identifying novel targets in wind signaling pathway. Wind is an evolutionarily concerned pathway which controls development of the organism and it is associated with various types of cancer and Alzheimer's disease. In a normal cell that is not stimulated by a wind ligand, beta-catenin is degraded by the destruction complex. Beta-catenin levels kept low in stasol. When a wind signal is present, uh, the destruction complex is held and the beta-catenin accumulated in the stasol. The beta-catenins travel then to the nucleus to interact with the TCF left transcription factors. That leads to the transcriptional regulation of the wind target genes. Genes that possess a TCF left binding site in their promoters are called direct target gene. Some, some of the binding sites are not functional, so we need more information to identify a target gene. The first gene target gene discovered in 1998 after the emergence of the key wind signaling components and the number of target genes grew over time and we think that there still might be a target genes that are yet to be found. We hypothesize that genes behave, target genes behave kind of similarly, not identical but in a similar fashion. So we thought if they behave similarly, that might be seen in the gene expression values of target genes. Thus, we used gene expression values to train a machine learning classifier that might see the similar behavior. Following several study, we assumed that target genes may be tissue specific. We decided to focus on colorectal cancer and we collected the data according to this assumption. Choice for colorectal cancer was due to the abundance of data in this tissue compared to the other tissues or diseases. We used this data to train special kind of machine learning classifiers. What classifier basically do is separate data into groups. After training it, after training, it can recognize Dali from Van Gogh. This is basically how supervised machine learning works. The positive and negative labeling denotes the binary nature of the problem. It does not refer to an inherent value. We show the classifier the negative and positive examples during training. After training, the trained classifier can assign a label to new cases. Machines do not see the pictures, or in our case, the genes, as we do. We have to 
represent them in a categorical or numerical values, which is a more machine-friendly way. We represented genes with differential expression data, which is a collection of genes represented as numerical vectors. Our goal is to identify novel target genes in wind signaling pathway. Contrary to classical machine learning problems, we only have validated positive cases, also known as bona fide target gene. We do not have a validated non-target genes of the pathway. So we have some positive cases and no negative cases. Since there might be other target genes we yet to know, our set of bona fide genes is also incomplete. Hypothesizing that the most of the genes are not target, the rest of the genes, all genes except the bona fide targets, would mostly contain the negatives but some target genes. This resembles to discovering a new painting of a famous painter. How will we decide if it's fake or not? We have a bunch of paintings at hand, in this case, genes with their target status unknown, and we have to identify genuine piece among them, which is in our case, it's the target gene. For the positive examples, we compiled a list of genes validated as targets. Hypothesizing that most of the genes are not targets, we chose negative examples from the rest of the genes. We used separated positive and negative cases to train the classifiers. After the training, we used the training classifiers to, assi to assign a label to each gene. We counted the number of times each gene is classified as target, and we calculated score based on this voting system. Classifiers are different from each other, because every time we train, we use a new, s new random set of exam negative examples. If the majority of votes are target, we deem the gene as target. We need to do some tinkering while training. Classification depends on the parameters called hyperparameter, which essentially affects the performance of the training. Our hyperparameters are sample size and penalty. Sample size is the number of randomly chosen negative examples in each training and we applied penalization for, for the misclassification of the genes. We also train classifiers with fake positive targets, which are chosen randomly. This is our negative control. We did this to validate that our compiled genes have a shared character characteristics and randomly selected genes cannot produce the same results. In the end, we train two sets of classifiers, first with bona fide targets and randomly chosen negatives, the second fake positives and negatives, both also chosen randomly. We used several sample sizes and penalty to see which one works the best. After the prediction, we compare these two sets to see their performances. The red numbers show the novel genes predicted by classifiers trained with bona fide examples. Blue numbers show the novel genes predicted by classifiers trained with fake positives. Recall is the rate of recovery of the positive examples. Since we do not want too many novel targets, our best results in hyperparameters are size 1200 and penalty 10. We recover all bona fide genes and predicted 108 novel target gene candidates. The genes that have the highest score are Patched 1 and the Glee 3. The interesting thing is, these genes have important roles in hedgehog signaling. So this might suggest that there might be a crosstalk between Wnt and hedgehog signaling. In parallel to our story, Boone Camp et al. also recently proved that Patch 1 is a colon specific wing target. We also predicted these genes as targets, and these genes have been reported as wing targets 
in tissues other than colorectal cancer. What are t key takeaways? We can find good candidates, candidates for experimental validation. Some of our predictions have already been validated. Also, when targets, target genes share some similar expression patterns and the machine learning method can discover new targets based on partial knowledge of positive examples. This was our study and thank you for listening. Okay, thank you for the um, clear presentation. Do we have any questions? Uh, we have a question from audience. Um, what was your dependent and independent variables in training the machine learning model? How was the gene sequences represented? Okay, is Jemre here? Yes, I'm here. I was thinking about the question, <laughs> actually. Uh, I can answer the second one. How was the gene uh, sequences represented. We represented them with a differential uh, expression data. Uh, we collected um, the data from NCBI, gene expression data, and we analyzed them. Uh, and then we used the result of that analysis to represent it to genes. Um, Can I also comment? I am the co-author. Of course. So uh, the, the first point is that the independent variables is, uh, as Jamie said, the gene expression data. There's nothing directly connected to the sequence. And the target uh, variable, the, the dependent, if you like, is the, the result is a classification problem. So it's either target or not target. It's a classification problem, not a regression problem. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Uh, is it novel? the uh, cross-talk between hedgehog and VNT? No, it's not a novel thing. Uh, there are several studies uh, have been reporting uh, this cross-talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to add a comment or speculation, let's say. Uh, if you would do the similar study with protein expression data, uh, what would be the difference? Uh, would it be better? What do you think? An interesting question. We have not tried. We we tried uh, previously, and in fact, as a paper published some years ago, with the uh, frequency of uh, uh, transcription factor binding site. So, in general, whatever uh, is, I mean, whatever biological feature that is connected to being target is something that we think we can detect. The, you know, it's a basic logic of machine learning. The novelty here is that uh, we don't have classical positive and negative cases. Is the, the novelty here is the sampling. Yeah. And then uh, it kind of, uh, well, the example that Jim said say that we are trying to discover if a new painting that we never seen before is fango or not, or is a fake fango. Uh, it's, it's not the classical machine learning case. So yes, I, I would like to try what you say. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any other uh, question? Okay, then uh, we are done. Uh, congratulations to all uh, for your patience. Uh, it was smooth two hours old, uh, two hours long uh, session and uh, very interesting uh, presentations. Thank you all, uh, our judges, presenters, organizers uh, and uh, audience uh, have a nice day uh, we will see with the uh, what is the next the plenary speak, speaking mm -hmm. guy i guess okay do you have any uh, extra point nihan yeah thank you professor dr mohammed and krebek mez and our honorable judges i would like to thank all our participants for being here with us so we will now return to the main hall where the next session will begin time for our last keynote talk uh, by dr yuvalita so thank you <laughs>